Okay, so welcome. Uh, today is uh, July 13th, um, 2024. Welcome to the post 2022 uh, group Zoom meeting. Uh, it's the 47th meeting, is that really true? Uh, so we went a long way already. And uh, always we have exciting talks, like the talks we have today, you see the agenda shared. And um, I think uh, there are quite interesting talks that I'm looking forward to. Uh, not my talk, <laughs> I know what I will talk about. But anyway, later on, you can also hear me talking. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I would say welcome everyone. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, George Oral is, is here, then uh, uh, we can start uh, uh, with the, the presentation there. So I'm, I'm actually not sure. So are, are you with us? I Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. So I will stop sharing and it's your task uh, then uh, to share whatever you have. And uh, we're looking forward for a interesting uh, presentation. So please yeah. go ahead. Okay, let me share my screen. Ah, yeah, so uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we see that. Color ah. script. Ah, yeah, so yeah, good evening and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. So yeah, uh, today I will share about color script and where, as I see you, everything is simple from installation to running your code. That's just a, a funny tagline. Uh, so first uh like just a quick trivia so what does this logo mean because this is the logo for color script so uh yeah so this uh this character is actually color written in by buy-in and where color means color in filipino language and by buy-in is an ancient filipino script so that's why it's color script and uh so yeah so what is color script so I would say it's a modern variant of color fort because first it's uh, implemented as a visual code extension. Uh, I uh, based on my observation, most of the mainstream language have a visual code extension. So so I use this approach and also using extension a uh, visual code extension, a Visual Studio code extension. It makes it easier to implement fort especially in JavaScript. And another reason why it's, I consider it modern is because it uh, use text files for the codes. So if if this, if we have this, so we can share uh, color for uh, source code to others like using GitHub because it's just plain text files. And uh, so I would say also it's a hybrid, hybrid fort because some words comes from color fort like these and Others are from standard fort and others are just uh, words that I implemented based on uh, non fort uh, words like uh, micro time or timestamp or I have this uh, checking for string or checking for num. And another reason is yeah, numbers are written as sign integer or hexadecimal or float. And for strings are just uh, enclosed with single or double quot quotation. So. And another is uh, another is uh, yeah, a scholar script is a uh, for intended for scripting. So hence the name color script script. So uh, what I would uh, like to mean scripting is yeah, we can use this for rapid prototyping and data parsing and code or data generator or um, maybe in the future uses test, test automation. And I would say in general, we, color script can be a alternative for Python, JavaScript, Lua, Ruby. And uh, so, yeah, uh, what are the colors in color scripts? So we have green for compiled words. It's like the uh, usual yellow for interpret, swore, inter gray for comment. So this is different from the usual color for. And uh, blue, I added blue as constant. And, uh, and magenta as variable. So we have constant and variable now. And uh, for red, it's, yeah, defining a function. And this white on black, uh, white for dark team and black for uh, light team. So it's just uh, because it's still a work in progress. So 
there's some invalid formats, meaning um, what if you use uh, a string or number as a, a name for a variable, a constant, so it will show white because it's not a valid name or word for a constant. And another case for white words is if the combination of uh, characters for a word is not yet uh, uh, not uh, registered for the regex uh, for the uh, coloring of syntax. So yeah, this will happen. So for this case, I ask uh, people to inform me if this uh, white word will occur. So how are the colors represented if it, it's in text files like ASCII? So the approach I use is uh, like using the spaces. So it's like indenting, like in Python, you uh, it will uh, count the spaces. So for green, there's a prefix one space. So if there's a space, a prefix one space in the word, it will be colored green. For yellow, two spaces. And for gray, three or four spaces. And uh, for blue, uh, postfix one space. So it means that after blue, it will be a green word. And uh, magenta postfix two spaces. So it means after magenta, it will be yellow. And red uh, postfix is three or four. So it means after red, there will be a gray, which is a comment. And, uh, and white, uh, yeah, it will be all of the above because it's just an indicator that this word is, is not registered or is, is in a valid format. Uh, in the demo, I can show you the those uh, what it means. So how, uh, yeah, so for color script, there's also addressing for color blindness. So for green, it will be shown as normal text, yellow, bold, and uh, a gray, it will be changed to italic, and blue, underlined text as well as magenta and red. So all definitions like defining constant, defining variable and defining functions are underlined. But the only way to distinguish between these three is just counting the how many how many spaces or the postfix space. And uh, yeah, for white and black, so it will be strike through. But on current version of color script, uh, this is not yet uh, implemented, so I will add this uh, syntax, uh, syntax, so, and uh, yeah, so why I created color script. So first is because I love color fort, because with color fort, it makes fort more simpler. And uh, I want to use color fort any time. So, and uh, I want to access color fort easily also. So that's why I use Visual Studio Code, because it's very easy to access. And uh, I want to run color for color for code in all major OS. So which also is addressed by Visual Code. So Visual Code, Visual Studio Code is available for Mac, Linux, and Windows, and even on Raspberry Pi. So you can run. And um, yeah, uh, another reason is I want to introduce color for to non forter like uh, uh, programmers using other uh, mainstream programming languages. So, and uh, yeah, I want to share color for codes, uh, which is possible with color script because the codes are in just text files. So we can use Git, Git repo to share. And uh, yeah, what's next for color script? Uh, first, yeah, I, I'm still working on some documentation, so I will try to complete it and share it uh, on the, on the rep, Git repo and uh, yeah, providing examples is will be a great. Uh, uh, will be a helpful to uh, share. Uh, I mean, it it will be helpful to have uh, examples. So I was planning like uh, solving the advent of code two thousand twenty three or the will one billion row challenge. So yeah, it's just part of the plan and also uh, adding necessary or requested words because there's uh, still some like arrays. It's not yet implemented or writing to a file. And there were words that are not like emit or yeah, some other necessary words. And yeah, se syntax highlighting on GitHub. So as of the moment, the syntax highlighting is only 
available in your uh, Visual Studio Code. So I want to to uh, to add this so that uh, other users without uh, they can see the colors of the of the uh, code even if it's still on the GitHub uh, browser. Um, and yeah, standalone virtual machine. So I I plan to have a a way to run your color script without uh, not under the Visual Studio uh Visual Studio Code uh IDE. So yeah, and uh, hopefully yeah I could uh, add a debugger. So yeah, I think uh that's it for my. So if there's any questions, uh, I could answer the questions. So yeah, thank you very much. Are there any questions? So please go ahead and uh, just open your mic and uh, raise your question. Do you have any sample applications? Uh, as, as of the moment, uh, no, but on my demo, I will just show some test, test uh, some scripts that I use for testing the color script but uh yeah that will be my plan to not just uh just solving uh, those uh, advent of code so I, I plan to make some uh real or useful uh, applications so that uh yeah it will be helpful to others mm -hmm. so cool. most of the application i'm aiming is yeah like for uh, as i mentioned a uh, color script is for scripting so my plan is like uh, CSV parser or JSON parser, or maybe I can also, once I have that word for connecting to HTTP, I can I can also plan to uh, make some, some applications to connect to uh, servers, like testing some APIs or, yeah, it's mostly uh, web, uh, web based or, or related to web, because I think that's, uh, Based on my observation, most fort is on embedded. So I think with color script, maybe we can, we can uh, try, uh, we can try add fort on the uh, uh, on this field of software, like regarding web or. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a question. Uh, so do do you completely rely on color as markup, or do you also intend to have something like? Um, special characters or different different fonts or different font ways like underlined or bold face uh, to display things or to, to mark up the different parts. I think of colorblind people and we know that ah. um, Howard, Howard did uh, some things in the original color force uh, to, to switch between uh, traditional syntax and color syntax. Uh, as of the moment, I just, uh, I plan just to use those what I have, like uh, normal text and uh, bold because it's, it was uh, an easier approach, mm -hmm. like just uh, because on the visual, uh, visual studio code uh, for the syntax highlighting, they, 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 they have a, a different tokenizer engine. So you just provide a regex and you just provide uh, what, what color and what's what what uh styling like is it normal and bold but if uh if i follow the usual color for way like for color blind you just add colon to the red words and mm -hmm. i i think it will it, it's doable but i think it, it will a bit complicate my approach and i don't want to move the shift the words or add insert the colon or so yeah, I just yeah, want yeah, I yeah. my plan is as simple as possible. So, yeah, I yeah think which that... is a good approach, and I I mean you can add support for it maybe later uh, if 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 you think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic, a... fantastic. I, Thank I, you. I, Thank I, you, I, Josh. I just uh, like to say I'm excited to see more people doing things with color flow. It's it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think I can show you. I can show some a quick demo. Uh, maybe I can show the how uh, if I if I still have time. Uh, or... sure. Go ahead. Ah, uh, okay. So, ah, uh... oh, 
Okay, so I have here the visual visual code. So uh I just let me just show how easy it will to install. You just go to the to, to this extensions, then just search color and it will show the color script here, which is already in the marketplace. So you just click install. And once it's installed, it will ask what uh team because there are there are two types of team, a uh, four which is colorblind dark or colorblind light or default dark. So I'll, we just select default team. And what uh, there's also on settings in the, where you can set a uh, verbose loading where we can show the details during loading. So maybe, uh yeah. So maybe we can check that. And uh, so, Okay, so it's already installed. So I have a folder here, which contains most of my uh, tests. So here and uh, the FIBO. So yeah, this is the Fibonacci from, uh, yeah, from Howard's uh, Color4. I just, just put it here and uh, also uh, test. So maybe we just use test. So test, we can load a file, like load and the file name as a string. And we can load uh, files containing on the folder. So, uh, and the usual color, color, colors of color for uh, there's a word loads where you can load, uh, provide the number, uh, block number. But for here, we just use the, use the same word load, but you should put all the files inside a the folder, then it will just go through. And uh, so, yeah, if I run this, so, Oh, sorry. Hmm. Oh wait. Let me open this. Oh, something wrong. Ah, oh, sorry. Let me try to. Maybe I need to close the visual code. After uh yes. I, after install, just. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, I just closed Visual Code and load it. So so once uh yeah, this should change the color script. So let me try run again. So yeah, here. So it's running. So because we check the verbose, so it will show some. Some information that on FIBO uh, we loaded this test key as or FIBO, and it will show what functions are defined. And there's a fold through, and so yeah. And um, so that's running the code, and we can also check what words built in words, like instead of writing words, we can just press F6. So these are the built in words with their yeah, information and even the user defined functions it will also show here from which file and these uh these uh stack uh yeah these these are also uh shown this is based on the comment on the on the uh function so like here in test key s print i then data num so if we check the code for print i so here then uh stock effect is a comment which is gray so this is how we define a function is that if you see it's a red red uh word and there's are there are three three uh spaces so if we like if we move it like for here four we can we can uh change this to yellow just add one space and if you want to comment out just an add another space and if you comment out the whole line you just and add another space because there are four spaces now uh, so if you want to go back so yeah and another feature so we have words and yeah for colorblind just press i think it's f7 oh, f i ah, yeah f8 so if you see the yellow becomes bold and the and the red becomes underlined and the gray becomes italic if I 
-hmm. press F6. So, and uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, ah, another thing is if you can also, um, uh, you can also run uh, words uh, like uh, in terminal. So I think it's, uh, let me color script. So yeah, executing words like uh, F4. So th then it asks for words to be executed. So we know that FIBO is already loaded. So we can also run here five and FIBO. So there's no need to put the, uh, the color tags like the spaces. It's just a normal spacing. So five FIBO. So yeah. Ah. Wait, is it loaded? So it's loaded. Um, why is it? Um, mm -hmm. ah, it's not FIB, it's FIB. Uh, F4, 5. Um, ah, okay, I think, uh, I missed oh, this, people. but yeah, there's a way to to run the to test the words not from the not from the source code, but Instead just like uh, running the people. word in a terminal. So I think I've shown all the. Okay. Uh, so there's executing word, loading file, a load file is actually the running the the code, which is F two then. Toggle light team. Ah, yeah. Toggle light team or dark team, which is F9. So, yeah, this is if we want light team. So, the background becomes white. And if we go back to dark, so, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's uh, that's it. All right. Yeah. Thank. Thank you very much. So very interesting. I got one more thing. is It's not a question. It's a request. I like this integration with uh, with Visual Studio Code. So I, I would just ask that when you document this, please document everything about this integration as well. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can do that, or I can also put the link uh, about how to create the extension but yeah let me add that on the documentation mm -hmm. yeah okay so yeah thank you everyone for your time i think that's uh yeah if there's any, no question then yeah i'll stop my sharing and proceed to the next uh, presenter great thank you very much george you you type feeble instead of fib maybe this will is what why it is the word done sorry okay. said, my, yeah. my microphone is working very well but i think that you you um, you typed uh, feeble instead of fib oh okay <laughs> yeah uh let that's me that's why your that. demo this didn't work Okay. Ah, yeah, I should use fib. Mm -hmm. I I saw fib instead of fibo. This ah, is yeah, thank you, uh, thank you. So yeah, you're right. I just got nervous. So yeah, Never thank mind. you. No worry, yeah. it's it's very good. It's very good. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Can you can you drop a link to the repository in? Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, let chat? me. That would be that. great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so George, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And we uh, will proceed. And our next speaker is Liam. Liam? Cool. <laughs> yeah, you will tell Hello. us. Liam. Liam. That's me. OK, <clears throat> yeah. And we learned about uh, a computer that I've been looking at for a long time. And um, eventually, uh, I get hold on uh, uh, one of the few ex existing examples or e existing uh, machines that are still there. Um, very, very interesting machine built by Jeff Reskin. But you will tell us all about that. 
and I, um, I uh, the hen and cat and uh liam will yeah we're, we're looking forward uh and especially i'm very excited to, to hear about that well i i hope that i can uh tell you some some interesting things about this machine so uh hi uh my name's liam proven i am the linux and open source reporter at the register a british uh, computer news uh, website um although i'm actually based in the isle of man these days um <clears throat> um recently the um editor asked me to do a retrospective on the macintosh computer which was released uh 40 years ago in january and when i uh wrote about that that also led me down the avenue of what inspired the macintosh um now i myself i've i've been writing for the register full time for nearly three years but as a freelancer for about 15 years but I'm I'm quite old and I'm a, a I've been a techie since the 80s. I started out on uh, home computers and my first was uh, the first one that I owned was a Sinclair Spectrum. I have as a visual aid a Spectrum Next here, which I think is going to uh, feature in the in the next talk as well. Um, and um, um, I much enjoyed playing around with BASIC, but I, I never really made the transition to fourth myself. It was, of course, one of the um, other most significant languages on in the 8-bit era. Um, but my career led me in a different direction from programming into uh, networking and building systems and um, installing and eventually into documenting uh, computer systems. And I, I never really moved on much from BASIC myself, but I think that BASIC had some attributes which are forgotten now, now that languages like Python are, are very trendy and for Unix people, Python looks very simple and clear, but there is some complexity that's inherent in Unix computers, which um, Python makes you confront and learn. And basic and indeed contemporaries like fourth didn't and that is also true of the not merely of the macintosh but the macintosh's forerunners so the mac happened because um apple's previous uh computer the apple lisa uh turned out to be a flop it was a pioneering machine for its time it was launched in 1981, and it was the first mass market computer with a graphical user interface. Um, but it was also a multitasking computer. It came with a hard disk as standard, and it did away with a great deal of the complexity that was common in, in computers at that time. The Lisa didn't really have programs. You simply tore off a piece of stationary from a pad. So if you wanted to create a document, you tore off a piece of paper from a stationary document and suddenly you could enter text into it and save it. You could tear off a piece of paper from a drawing pad and then draw on it and save it without ever having to know what program you'd be using. The Mac had to throw away a lot of that to fit it into a machine which was a quarter of the price and could cope with a single floppy. But the Mac started off as a very different project from a guy called Jeff Raskin. And Raskin is sadly uh, dead now. He, he died over a decade ago. Um, he was one of the team at Xerox Park that uh, did, worked on the Smalltalk programming language and object-oriented uh, programming and the, the original uh, windowing interface. He, um, you know, that project also included some very other important technology. And later on, he went and got a job with Apple. And he is the man that persuaded Steve Jobs to visit Xerox Park and see the Alto machine that Xerox were working on. Raskin is the man who gave 
Jobs the idea that led to the Lisa and the Mac. Raskin was working on his own uh, idea for a computer at the time within Apple. Um, and he named that project after his favorite variety of Apple, the fruit, which is an Apple called the Macintosh. And he named his computer the Macintosh. Uh, unfortunately for, for Jeff Raskin, uh, Steve Jobs got taken off the Lisa project that he had inspired and designed, aimed at being a graphical user interface computer. And Jobs took over Jeff Raskin's project, the Macintosh. Raskin was very unhappy with the way that Jobs was taking the project, so he quit. He started his own company called Information Appliance Limited. He designed a computer and looked for someone to build it. And that compute, that company was Canon, the Japanese word processor and printer manufacturer. And the computer that resulted was the Canon Cat. Now, they only sold in the region of about 20 to 50,000 units of Canon Cat. Um, they're pretty scarce these days. But a very interesting uh, vintage computer expert, a guy called um, uh, uh, Cameron Kaiser, wrote a blog post early this year. And I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. This was kind of the inspiration and the germination of my article. He picked up a Canon Cat quite inexpensively on eBay. And he documents the process of disassembling it, which is not trivial and uh, replacing some parts of the floppy drive to get it working. And that led me to write an article about the Canon Cat for the register. Um, and that's what led to this talk happening. Um, the Canon Cat represents an avenue that computing could have taken but did not. And in a way, the industry today is circling back towards this idea, um, but doing it in an extremely inefficient and complicated way. The CAT was a very simple machine. Now, I, I don't have any presentation or anything for this, but I'll, I'll give you some links to, to follow up. Um, the CAT was a machine that had a very early graphical user interface, but it didn't have any kind of pointing device. It was entirely driven by the keyboard. Yes, by all means, that, that's the, the register link there, and you can do whatever you like with that. Um, and um, it added two keys to the basic keyboard design, which were called leap. Um, the leap key on its own um, moved forwards or backwards a word or a, a letter or a word or a sentence or a paragraph at a time but you could also hold down leap and type some letters and it would then search for the preceding or following instance of that word. It's a very radically simple graphical user interface because it doesn't have windows, it doesn't have dialog boxes, it doesn't have programs or files. The idea of it was that it would be a an appliance for handling information in the same way, Raskin said, that a device like a toaster is an appliance for making toast and a telephone is an appliance for making calls. A toaster doesn't have an on-off switch. An, an, an ordinary landline telephone doesn't have an on-off switch. And Raskin didn't want the cat to have an on-off switch, although I gather somebody at Canon overruled him and, and forced him. Um, it does have a floppy drive, but it doesn't have files. What it can basically do is it saves your entire workspace as an image of memory onto the floppy disk. And if you turn the computer on and you put a floppy disk in, it loads everything that you are working on back into memory. It works as a sort of giant text editor. If you turn it on, you can just start entering text. You can do very simple formatting on that text. It understands and can show fonts and things. It can do bold and underline and italic and things like that. It can obviously print that text, but it could also fax that text to somebody. It could save snippets of text 
over a serial cable and send them to other computers. You could attach a telephone line to it and you could send blocks of text to other people. So this very clever, sophisticated text editor would also allow your little computer to be a fax machine. Without ever having a fax application, it would allow you to email people um, without having a separate email application. Um, you could enter a column of figures and generate tables and format those tables. But once you had columns of figures in the device, you could total or average a column. You could ask it to calculate the difference between columns and numbers in columns. So this single text editing program was also able to work as a spreadsheet. It had the ability to save people and their contact details and reload them. So it dispenses with the whole idea of separate applications. And you need to know what program you are in to do a particular task by turning this into all just information and one program which can be extended to add new functions to it does whatever you want to do with the information you enter into it. If the information is addresses, it will search them and sort them. If the information is numbers, it will do calculations on them. The plan was to add the ability to, to do charts. And to make this software small and simple and efficient, it was entirely implemented in fourth. This is a essentially a monolithic fourth program, which is both the operating system and its single application and the user interface all in one. But it did have APIs and it was designed to be extensible. And the plan that Raskin had was that there would be an aftermarket that you could buy extensions to your cat's functionality and load them in off a disk or download them from another computer. And suddenly your cat would know how to do new things with information and it could grow along with you. Um, now, the, the, the cat did have a uh, forerunner. Um, he prototyped some of these ideas in the form of an add-in card for the Apple II computer, which was called the Swift card, which had a simpler earlier version of the uh, fourth application in a ROM chip. Um, the Swift card has been disassembled and the code is, is out there. The software for the Canon Cat, which was never published at the time, um, was disassembled. Canon do not own the, uh, the design. They only own this implementation of it. Uh, Raskin's son, Asa Raskin, went on to further develop some of his father's ideas. And he uh, created a uh, software system for Windows, which was available as free software. Um, Raskin also codified some of his work in the form of a book, The Humane Interface, which I see somebody has already uh, mentioned in the chat there. The uh, Canon Cat 4 software is out there. Some of it was posted onto uh, Complang 4 many years ago, I believe. Um, um, there's also uh, a lot of uh, documentation. Um, all the manuals and so on are still out there. Um, there are several pages which have reams of information about the, uh, the Canon Cat. Its manuals have been preserved. There are demonstration videos and adverts of the Canon Cat. There are even some uh, prototypes of what Information Appliance Limited hoped to do next, including the uh, Swift laptop, which was a laptop before the ideas for laptops had really been formalized. And uh, there are pictures of it on that page I, I, I just linked to with um, 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 an LCD screen and uh, a keyboard with the leap keys on either side of the spacebar. Um, Given that 
the software is out there now. I think it would be a fascinating project. That there is at least one Canon Cat emulator. It's been implemented in JavaScript and it's available on the Internet Archive. And if you go to the Internet Archive and look at the Canon Cat uh, manuals and um, the video cassette that was uh, in the bug in the box with the machine with a demo, you can actually fire up a Canon Cat instance in your web page and play with it. Although without the correct keyboard and so on, I think it's a little bit impenetrable to use. But there is um, the software is out there. I think it would be a fantastic exercise for the for the hobbyist community to try to get the cat software running on on some more modern uh, fourth that can run on top of present day operating systems on Windows and Mac and so on as a sort of um, text editor application. And I think that there is, you know, I could dream about this, but that there is, I think, possibly potential there to build it on one of the bare metal forths out there and make this some sort of uh, distraction free writing environment that you could boot up on a generic machine and work with uh, text numbers, potentially graphics, but not press Alt tab and switch to a web browser and then lose three hours of your day because somebody on the internet was wrong and it was vitally important to tell them. Um, because I can certainly say that uh, this is a problem that really affects me on a regular basis as a writer. Um, Quora is a desperately bad website for this. They've basically provided uh, XKCD Comic 386 as a service, um, <laughs> crowdsourced it. There's always somebody wrong on Quora, and there's hours of fun to be had in telling them so. Um, so, yeah, um, I sadly enough, I don't own a Canon Cat much as I would like to. Um, um, a couple of owners of the machines have said that they got lucky on eBay. Um, and I've picked them up for just tens of dollars, but I fear that maybe these days they are too well known. But um, it it would, in principle, I think, be possible to to resurrect this as a as a standalone app, maybe that could understand more modern keyboard layout, and had the ability to save its memory onto files on disk and and load them again. Um, I'd I'd love to see somebody resurrect some of the ideas of the cat. The very simple. The idea of a very simple computer that you don't need to know anything about programs to work with has been resurrected today, of course, in the form of our featureless, buttonless smartphones. But hidden underneath the surface of any one of these is multiple gigabyte Unix operating system with its myriad of little config files and about 200 different scripting languages all hidden. Um, the cat is designed to be extensible, and its software was designed to be hackable upon by by people using Forth. Um, there you are. That's 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 what I know about the Canon Cat, and I hope that that was um, of some interest um, for me. It, although the machine itself was a failure, um, I think it shows a whole other way that computers could have gone, and it's very very interesting for me to think. Well, what if Raskin had been allowed to pr pursue this project while he was at Apple? And Apple had produced this information appliance, the original Macintosh, as its successor to the Apple II and the Apple III. And maybe the Apple II GS line could have taken over as the color media computer for, for hobbyists and so on. The, the, there is a whole other world that never happened. Fourth is, of course, just, just one part of that. There you go. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you Liam. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions to Liam? Not a question, but I I would like to add, there are same uh, some famous uh, pictures of of Raskin uh, in Japan or in America. I don't know. I can't remember. With a huge depot of these computers of these cannons, I think they produced fifty thousand units but only sold in the beginning very slowly chunks of 5,000 mm -hmm. units and they were very concerned because Raskin was in this depot huge amount of of cases of, of boxes with the Canon cat and not easy to sell I mm -hmm. I don't know why 
I, I, I don't know the, the, if the my, price was... It was too wrong. uncommon. I think my impression is that Canon did not know how to market this computer. And at the time, they, they sold word processors. The company did go on to do more ambitious products. For example, another almost forgotten Canon machine is Canon did a device later. I think it was called the Object Station. It was one of the only non-Next computers that was sold running the Next operating system as its native OS. Um, and this was the x86 version of uh, Next Step. And the object station, I think, was a pizza box with a 486 in it running Next Step. Um, when Next was already starting to pull out of doing hardware um, because it too had difficulty selling its machines, partly because they were $30,000 or something new. Mm -hmm. um, only a few years after the Canon Cat launched, which was, I think, about 1988, um, nine, uh, 1987, the yes, 87, um, Amstrad launched the PCW range, the, the CPM machine I mentioned in the chat earlier. And the CPM was was sort of, the, the opposite, the, the, PC, the Amstrad PCW was a very technically unambitious computer. It was 70s technology packaged up in an easy to use all in one unit um, in the era of x86 PCs. Mm. But it was designed to be deeply unintimidating. If you wanted to write words, you put the word processor disk in and turned it on. If you wanted to do anything else, which I think many owners never did, you put the CPM disk in and turned it on. And because it was old tech, it was cheap. And Amstrad sold millions of them. Um, it's it's quite common to hear uh, Commodore fans, especially from the Commodore 64 era, talk about the Commodore 128 as the last new 8-bit computer. But it really wasn't. The Amstrad PCW came along after the Commodore 128 and sold well, well, millions the, of them. In, in some, in some um, from some view, uh, this was a revolu revolutionary computer, and one of the problems, as you well said, was marketing. Canon did not know how to market the computer, but another problem, somebody put on the chat MS-DOS, no, this is another problem, but, but one of the problems was uh, the, uh, it had no mouse, so this confused the people because it was m much more productive without the mouse. Yeah. But probably they they should have inserted a mouse as a I don't know as a as an alternative. The, yeah. The think... the joke is that that Raskin gave it the name cat because cats kill mice. Haha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and Apple made his Macintosh project into a mouse based computer, which which he didn't like and didn't approve of. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's true. It's 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 only a rumor, but uh, it's yeah, one that I uh, like. <laughs> I think actually. Uh... Uh, Reskin's idea was that it's not a computer at all, it's an appliance exactly. that um, does solve tasks for you and it's not programmable in the sense uh, that you want, uh, that you typically saw. Of course, you could if you if you want to. And this raises my question, do you know which dialect of force uh, this I uh, think actually it, uses? It, I think it's called t mm -hmm. and I do not know anything about this, yeah, yeah. this form of the language. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I, I don't know exactly, uh, but I, I, I think uh, during my research I saw that the, the source code of the FOSS system itself is also available somewhere, so that is great for us. And uh, also QEMO uh, has support for the Canon CAD, so mm -hmm. if you want to run it locally, uh, you have to have some tweaking and then uh, go ahead. Aha, here we go. Yeah, great, Peter. You collected all the resources already. <laughs> Very good. If you enter into this uh, site, I copied a lot of links from the internet so you can find everything because I love this computer. I really love the Canon Cut. Mm -hmm. in, in another world, it, it should have been great and it should have transformed the, the industry. I, I think 
that there were a lot of ideas in the Lisa as well that that we should have listened to and moved away from this mini computer model of of applications that operate on files and users have to learn about this stuff. Um, I, I had a startup company in 2009, which um, produced what we what we internally called a computer for grandmothers. Um, and no offense is intended to mothers or grandmothers, but a, a computer that would let very non-technical people get online, talk to email and Skype with their uh, far off family. Um, a year after we launched, Apple launched the iPad and uh, pretty much destroyed us. Um, but a sign of that was that my mom has one of these machines herself, obviously. Um, but a couple of years later, when, when the company was winding down and there were no more software updates, I got her a used iPad to see if she'd be able to use this. And she just picked up the package and from the size and weight went, oh, is it an iPad? Cool. Um, such, such was the penetration of the idea of a simple to use unintimidating computer you know the, the the market was there maybe he was just too early and had just too different an approach mm -hmm. so uh, thank you very I did much for your time. sorry i did post a uh, link to the software uh, to the source code in the chat so if you want to add that to the uh, fourth books uh, that'd be great I think it's it is. Mm -hmm. I think it is in the in the in the in the books. But if not, I can link it, of course. Uh, uh, it, I don't know if if Liam uh, uh, explained that all this the interface was a hypertext, and when you um, when you uh, power on the computer, it would go immediately to the last text you were typing or working with, you didn't have anything to do. It was just a working station. It was nothing to play around or, or pressing buttons, nothing. It was automatically. Uh, so it was a fantastic machine for, for its time. It was really, really many, many years ahead. I completely agree. Yes. Um, I. I do hope I can find one one day, but uh, but these days I am a a married a married man with a with a four year old daughter, and my wife is uh, sadly not interested in my uh, hobby of collecting old and interesting computers, and feels that I already have too many. She does maybe have a point there, but an, a, both a next computer and uh, a Canon Cat would be very very high on my wish list. Yeah. Right, I think there's another speaker coming up now, so I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to leave you and go and join my family who are at the beach and waiting for me right now. Thank you so much for inviting me, and yeah. I'll, I'll try to drop into thank a future meeting. Liam, thank yeah. you very much for thank joining. You, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah, that was interesting. Great. Bye. Exactly. I, we have another speaker coming up, and that is uh, our well-known Travis Beeman. Uh, author of Zepto Force, and uh, he will talk about Zepto Script, and we will learn about what a dynamic force language actually is. So, Travis, please go ahead. Okay. Share my screen. <coughs> Okay, I've got Zepto script loaded on here. And as a recent addition, I have support for FAT32 file systems in the onboard flash of the Pico, in this case, the Pico W. So this nice little routine here we have is it calculates the first 25 Fibonacci numbers using coroutines. So yeah, compile it, then do like this, which is this is a very trivial test. And as you can see it's 
using suspend and resume to generate the sequence of numbers for our nice, friendly coroutine Fibonacci thing. And, but anyways, the key aspects of ZeptoScript is that it tries to be as fourth as it can be, or at least Zepto fourth as it can be, while uh, providing dynamic typing and garbage collection. And because it's garbage collected, it can allocate anything it wants to a heap and you don't have to worry about it. Like for instance, here we are def defining a, uh, what I call a cell sequence, which it's, a, it's an array of values but it's distinct from an array in that it is a fixed size. It's a primitive in ZeptoScript, whereas arrays, which are resizable and all that are built upon that. And then let's go and uh, filter it so we only get even values. And then Let's go ahead and to the, take the even values and add one to them with the map. And then we're going to iterate over it and print the values. So here we, through this little snippet of code, we get this. And And as you can see, the side from this, which is a bit of syntactic sugar to make defining things like this easy, uh, and syntax is definitely forthy, but it allows you to do unforthy things like out all keep allocating uh, sequences of values filtering them to create new sequences, mapping them, and all that kind of stuff. And now I'm going to search the uh, file system of, or not search, but list the file system of on this Pico here for a second program that I have, which this program is It's basically a implementation of an example from the pragmatic programmer, which when I was on vacation in June, I read the book during it. And I felt like I wanted to go and implement it. It's this example itself using actors, or at least the closest to an actor that I could make within Zepto script, which this is using ZeptoScript's uh, multitasking functionality, which unlike Zepto fourth multitasking, it's single, uh, it's that it runs within a single Zepto fourth task, but uses uh, cooperative multitasking. But anyways, as we have here, we, we go and have code for implementing a number of different actors like a way to, like a like a customer a waiter a food uh, source of food and an arbiter to control access to the sources of food so multiple orders don't stop on top of one another. And here we go and create an actor which basically take a 
execution token, which in ZeptoScript can be partially applied in which such partial application I rely upon heavily. And it creates an unbounded channel for it, passes the unbounded channel to the uh, pass the execution token after forking and then returns the execution, the unbounded channel to the caller. So let's go and uh, compile our pi alum mode example. Now we're going to go and do high a la mode test. And here's the output that Devin shows everything it's doing here. Anyways, beyond examples like this, ZeptoScript supports things like a variety of different data structure types. Like for instance, one type is a map. And with this map, we can go in, let's say create a number of different values. This is what I call a generic map because it uses the, uh, there's a set of uh, methods in the object orientation layer that are designed to be used for just about anything, such as converting them into strings or hashes or testing their equality in a generic map because you don't specify such words, it uses those default ones automatically. Now we're going to create a global and say my map, and then I'm going to go and add the this map that we created to that. And then we go in We can print what's in the map, or we can, let's say, test for, we want to get bar. We can get that. Or another kind of data structure we support is sets, which are like maps, except for that they don't have uh, They don't have key value pair to just values. Oh, forgot to import set. And then And we're going to go and iterate over the set. And it also supports, in addition to uh, cell and byte sequences, and cell and byte slices, which a slice is, is basically, it's a range of a sequence except for it doesn't, you can have multiple slices all point to the same underlying sequence. Let's say we, that, that we have arrays, we have maps, we have sets, we have queues, which are used heavily by multitasking. We have coroutines. We have bit arrays or bit sets more like. Uh,
And all this, we go and have a language which in many ways is much richer than what could easily be done in fourth, because in fourth you have to tie by the, the memory model. Where in the memory model, we go, you have to go and reallocate all your space for stuff. You can't, unless you are using a heap, which not all fourths have heaps, you can't go in and say, hey, I want a foo now and just have it magically appear. You have to plot how you're going to get memory for the foo and then tear it down if you're ever going to be done with it and all that. But because this is garbage collected, that's not an issue. So let's say we go in, do our pile mode test. And then we're going to garbage collect it and then do heap free. And we do run the test again. It's gar each time it's creating a whole bunch of, ta of tasks and, and unbounded channels. But we, when we garbage collect it, in this case manually, and we get the free number of free values in the heap, it doesn't change because it's smart enough to say, hey, we aren't using this anymore. Let's get rid of it all. Without the user having to worry about, oh, how am I going to get rid of these tasks when I'm done with them or anything of that sort? And and this and this basically how I put it you you get all of this for free, whereas. Let's say in this for this is not an application for Zepto script, but rather for Zepto fourth. Uh, Zepto ed, which is a text editor that I wrote, in Zepto ed, I have to manu not just manually allocate all the space I need, but I have to also manually free it. And if I don't, there'll be memory leaks which I have run into with it, which have been, since been fixed. But in general, it's much more painful to do a lot of this stuff that you can do in this without even thinking in a fourth such as Zepto fourth for the reasons that I mentioned. So the So I think that Zepto script has quite a bit of potential still in its infancy stages. I haven't even made any releases for it yet because I still keep on changing lots of stuff around them. Like yesterday I decided, hey, I don't want to go and use uh, cell sequences in the form of records as the basis of my arrays, sets, and maps because it required a whole bunch of hackery to have words like show and hash and equal work with them properly. So I pulled it all apart and I reworked that so they would be their own uh, data types underneath it all. Well, specifically they'd be their own classes. And 
there is one thing I should sh mention is this does ha this has an object system, but it's not forced upon the user. But for some examples of how the object system works, here is an example of it. And as you can see, methods do not belong to any particular class. And also, classes do not have inheritance, unlike many OO systems. Rather, any class can implement any number of different methods. Essentially, they're duct types. Uh, and while uh, classes can have members, like this one, those members are local to the class. They cannot be directly accessed outside of the class. And the, the idea is that if you want to expose them, you would write accessor methods for pulling the values out or setting the values on the objects. So, like here we go and have, have each of these actually creates a pair of accessor words unto themselves that are only readable for, or usable from within this class, such as this, where we set it or we get it. And we also li list the implementations for each of these within the class. The new method is a special one because it, it when you declare a class, we go in, get a make foobar uh, 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 word that's automatically created, which when called, it instantiates a member of that class and then calls this with that uh, instance. Anyways, I've been probably all over the place here, so, and I've probably taken up a good amount of time, so I'm setting this over for any comments or questions. Yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions to Travis? I have one. Yeah, exactly. Um, that fork word that uh, creates um, like a process thread thing, does it create a thread in the operating system or is it something that you have? handle in in, uh, in in your kernel oh I should I should have mentioned zepto fourth ones and bare metal but Ze you could say that zepto fourth is the operating system in this case and fork does not create a zepto fourth task rather it creates a cooperative task within the zepto script environment which is distinct from Zepto fourth tasks because they're much more lightweight and they are implemented with continuations actually. I actually borrowed the code for it from a similar multitasking system I'd implemented a while back in Scheme. I see Christian Hinzi is got his hand up. Yes, I hope my microphone is working. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. 
So I got stuck on one definition of a word, okay, when you started talking about uh, zeptoscript. And it's the definition of the word script itself. How is it different from any other programming language? What is a script? Well, basically, in this case, when I originally created it, I had intended it for being able to use, to extend programs that are written in Zepto fourth, hence Zepto script. Even though it's sort of taken a life of its own, and I haven't actually embedded it in any applications for Zepto fourth as of yet. So it's these days it's more of a standalone language that's layered on top of the Zepto fourth environment. So Zepto script is essentially a kind of application written in in Zepto four. Yes. And this application has the purpose of simplifying programming by providing specialized word or more easier to use word more or less well it, pro it provides a whole new language environment and in many ways okay. it is much i find it to be much simpler to work with than zepto fourth the only problem with it, though, is it's much more memory intensive, which is actually, in many ways, uh, a result of a conscious design decision I made. Because in a different uh, language that's for embedded systems, that's garbage collected uh, MicroPython, they have the problem of memory fragmentation, where like someone will make their uh, weather station in MicroPython. And after running for a few weeks, it fails. And then they're wondering, hey, why did my weather station fail? Well, it kept on allocating and getting and a garbage collecting memory until memory became so fragmented that it could no longer allocate more memory due to the fragmentation. And the So the decision I made was to use Cheney's algorithm. It's simple, it's fast, it's the speed of garbage collection is determined by the size of the working set rather than the size of memory. The only cost it comes at is that half of your heap can be only used at a time, which is a, to me at least, a small price to pay, considering that Cheney's algorithm, as it's a compacting algorithm, is basically completely immune to fragmentation. So in, if I simplify all this in what I, uh, I understood, you wrote your own programming language with Zepto 4. Yes. <laughs> okay. And from what I looked at, it was mostly text. Okay, but does it, it remain? It, it still is interactive. Yes, it is. You could end. It is okay. So I was just wondering if it was a kind of compiled text, but it's it's really interactive. It, it compiles just like any fourth does. It actually uses the. Zepto fourth compiler underneath it all rather than going and 
implementing a new compiler from scratch. Okay. So you clarified quite a few points for me. Thanks a lot, Travis. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah, thank you very much. And are there additional questions? I have I have two questions, yeah. Ulrich. Go ahead. Um, yeah. My, my my first my first question, I guess, is so this seems like a quite a useful addition in terms of um, if you want to do sort of high level work. How do how do the the how does the rest of humanity learn about about Zepto script? I mean, effectively. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, it's got similarities to fourth, but it's got a lot of, lots of differences as well. Have you got any plans to do some sort of uh, sort of guides, quick start guides, and a, and a and a programming course or something? How how are you going to tackle? I mean, I I know that this is sort of some of it's still fluid, so it's always tricky doing documentation when it's still fluid. Uh, I guess my second question is about the interoperation between. Um, Zepto fourth and Zepto script. So it, so it seems that some problems or some parts of a problem, it's it's really good to use fourth because it's it's quite low level, it's quite close to the machine. But other parts of the problem you want to do in Zepto script because you've got maybe some complicated memory management. I mean, if you've got networking is often when you've got complicated networking like a web server or something. Doing it in four, it's possible to do it in fourth, but managing that sort of memory and all that sort of stuff can get tricky. So it seems like there'd be a bunch of applications where you'd want low level primitives in fourth and uh, sort of high level stuff written in Zepto script. Those are my two uh, questions. Yes, you can do that. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the first question, I've written documentation for it and I wrote a few wiki pages for it on the ZeptoScript GitHub. And uh, yeah. that sh should, the wiki pages really cover a lot of material regarding it. And as for the second question, uh, yes, this. You can go in, write code that you can call from in Zepto fourth from Zepto script, and I already do that uh, quite heavily. Like for instance, in I'd say execute this. The layer for implementing the underlying media for the file system here is implemented in Zepto fourth. And then I call it from Zepto script. So yeah, you can definitely construct parts of your program in Zepto fourth and then call them from Zepto script. The only gotcha is that you have to be careful you can't really call from Zepto. You can't go the opposite direction very easily and call Zepto script from Zepto fourth. Because even though in many cases it's safe, it's not 100% safe because the garbage collector for Zepto script uh, it examines the contents of both the data and return stacks. And it goes and sees, are there any uh, pointers into the uh, heap space of Zepto script? And if there are, which basically in this case is, is there any values that are cell aligned within a specified address range. It assumes that they are indeed uh, allocated blocks of memory within the heap. If they are not, then bad things happen.
Any more questions? Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. So Travis, thank you again for the great talk. And definitely we should look at ZeptoScript and see uh, what uh, additional features we can explore. Thank you very much. So today is the day of dream machines. I, I don't know whether you know the book of uh, Ted Nelson, uh, Computer Lib Dream Machines, which was very popular uh, in the last century. Um, looked at uh, computers and the way they should be, not the way uh, it actually turned out today. And um, so uh, we will have a talk uh, after we learned about the Canon Cat now about the Spectrum Next computer. And uh, so Matteo uh, Vittori will tell us about that. Yes, and yes. I'm also very curious uh, because yes, I have yes, a yes. Spectrum Next on let my me, own. Let me... Okay, I uh, invite you to um, get to to to, to show to um, to magnify my my screen because I have no interface. I I just uh, put in place a uh, webcam to to see my <laughs> my, right, I my screen. Like this. I'm so sorry, I... but I will I will buy in the future. I hope it, it can you can see everything. It's quite large, but uh, okay. This is, uh, I was toying, I was playing around um, and already loaded RP0 interface. Um, what I did, uh, well, you know that uh, uh, the, the next uh, Spectrum Next uh, is a FPGA based computer. And inside it, uh, it has a, a Raspberry P0. So it, it, it can be accessed uh, via UAR, UAR the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. I hope I spelled good. And uh, the, well, to achieve my purpose to to talk with uh, uh, this uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, I had to read the doc documentation and find out how to select the correct uh, UART and the baud rate. So I put in place uh, an, a loop, a simple loop that uh, pull, pause the keyboard and transmit the key and receive anything the Raspberry send back and display it to read it to, to stream. It's just like that. There were some constraint constraint because there is no transmit buffer. There is only a 2012 bytes long receiver buffer. And we have and notorious is low machine, 28 megahertz, and we can go to one, it's not very, 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 very fast anyway. So let me, let me start. Um, the, um, okay. okay, this is the, the supervisor. I, I restarted it and uh, the terminal is just like that. So I transformed my ZX Spectrum into a dumb uh, terminal that uh, uh, talks with uh, the Raspberry, and we can uh, see what it uh, what it it got. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm very <laughs> the keyboard is not very friendly. Okay, it uh, it this is just a simple. Uh, mm, uh, Unix-like, Linux-like uh, system. To go back to fort, I have to press break in this way. So we return to our system. I was looking to, uh, sorry, 900 list. Okay, okay, okay. This is where I began to code. What we can do? Well, I put in place a few fort words that ask something and display it's uh, uh, the reply, then ask again something. Let me run simply. Mm, I, I, I mean, I put in place a wrapper around the uh, Raspberry P, P0, this way. So, and coded as some simple um, words, definitions that can talk and receive back anything. So let me see. 
let, let me you see. I'm sorry. I I I I did the wrong eight nine nine. Sorry. Let me try. Sorry again. I I forgot to import this definition. Okay. Eight nine nine load. Okay. This is as far as can go. I mean, from Ford, I asked the, the bash version and the Raspberry replied that number. I asked again, what date is now and what time is now? Uh, well, I, okay, that's all. <laughs> you can see that uh, the date is wrong. I mean, the Raspberry, when it boots, it boots at the 2021. So I, I think I just can modify and put uh, what time is now yeah, is uh, almost as not correct what I I foresee it was uh, when I uh, could run this uh, this uh, stream a nine nine load okay when we go back to term and see what it does this is the Unix terminal date and I correctly set up the correct date, the today date and time in a Raspberry Pi. What can we do? We can do something like uh, Python. And this is Python. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. We can do some lo very long multiplication and see what it, what it does. Spectrum cannot, this, cannot do this <laughs> in such a, a short time. So this is a real uh, good experiment from my point of view. Any question? That's, <laughs> this is far as I, I went in my journey to the spectrum. So Matteo, could if you're writing a program for the spectrum next in Z8 in using fourth, you could use this system to get the Raspberry Pi Zero with the ARM fast arm process to, to to do you know acceleration of your fourth yes, program yes yes i so you could I, you've eventually got a set of words that can communicate yes. with the raspberry pi from fourth yes. over the uart yes yes and if you wanted to do a complicated calculation maybe oh, yes. um, some 3d mathematics or something called matrix multiplications yeah. you'd actually this, get the yeah go ahead you're right i i put in place this uh, few words to um, put in place a communication that it should be fast. It is not so fast because uh, um, there is a uh, much delay, much delay from the, uh, the ask and the reply. So if uh, we want to do something uh, really usable, we should put in place some uh, peculiar protocol that uh, continuously send uh, sends uh, bytes and receives packets from the, the Raspberry. So this is not the case. This is just a terminal. I transform my spectrum in a dumb terminal, the, just the keyboard, and see what it does. So, but uh, your idea is good. is is fine. Uh, <laughs> the the only problem is to code and test it. But the, sure. Yeah, I mean, as, as you pointed right. out, I mean, the, the Z80 is, is not yeah. very fast to do, no, no, for instance, it's... floating point maths, right? It's, uh, it's... Whereas, the, whereas the Raspberry Pi, just because it's a, an arm running at you know, 700 megahertz, it's very yeah. fast. It's very fast. So you can very offload fast. computation to that that Raspberry Pi in the Spectrum yeah. Next and do do things that nobody in the 80s thought would, would be thought possible. I have I have in mind some ideas to improve this protocol. This is just an, an a probe to see what the Raspberry can do. But you're right. Uh, the spectrum is uh, is I mean uh, a stop door uh, is is faster than the spectrum. I <laughs> okay. Or a door stop. What do you say in English? Door stop. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, a doorstop is faster than a spectrum, but the Raspberry is 
uh, is faster. So if we can do very long calculation. I mean, we could uh, prepare in advance uh, any script uh, in Python, for example, and uh, um, uh, trigger them, any of them, by one byte uh, sent from the spectrum and uh, receive back uh, um, uh, the reply, the long uh, computational uh, 3D, 3D graphics uh, and so on. Yes, yes. Your point is what I I should do. Should do. All right. So yeah, thank you very much for showing this. Are there any additional questions? Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, we have a situation that uh, we don't normally have. We are ahead of time. Wow. <laughs> Uh, that's great. So uh, the schedule actually says uh, we should go ahead and um, do a coffee break or whatever, get some glass of water or whatever is suitable at your side at the time. Um, and I would uh, suggest that we meet in uh, what is good, 15 minutes or so. Okay, everyone aboard. Next participant is uh, Brad Nelson, who will present us a color, another color force version. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, can, can everyone see that? Yep. Great. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, yet another color force implementation. Um, so, uh, why color forth? Um, it, it's a, uh, a fun dialect, uh, invented by, uh, Chuck Moore, uh, and, uh, it uses color tags to dispatch, uh, which I, I happen to think is actually a tremendous simpl simplification of how forths are usually implemented. And I think that, uh, it is, it is fascinating to, uh, to think about how to make forth even simpler. And uh, I think it's actually kind of a, a powerful idea. Um, uh, as, as is common, I guess, with Colorforth talks, a note about color. Um, I, um, one, one thing I often think about whenever I um, explore something in this space is uh, uh, there are actually a few folks um, in the fourth community that are colorblind and that, uh, that actually have challenges seeing the Colorforth colors, including uh, our friend Dennis Rufer, who uh, actually does a bunch of things in color forth. So I, I, you know, as I worked on yet another uh, color forth, I, I got to thinking about the, the, the color palette used. And so um, I, I've got a few things that I haven't had a chance to run it by him yet. Um, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting uh, color scheme uh, that ostensibly is, is more uh, visible to a range of folks with color blindness that I, I'm curious to run by him. But a more a more basic idea that, that I had uh, that I've been playing around with is uh, is to just use a scheme that uh, that doesn't emphasize uh, red red green, which is the the most uh, common type. And I've actually found that uh, having used it for for now about a week, uh, that that in, in some ways it grows on you. The the uh, the ordinary color forth scheme is is very harsh, and so. Uh, I'm I'm sort of trying to lean into to using that scheme, uh, and we'll we'll use that in this talk. Uh, I may run this this one by him, uh, which is sort of understandable to folks can, uh, acquainted with the typical colors, but uh, but this is the one I'm going to try for this talk, um, and maybe it will grow on you. I'd be curious what you think in the in the chat comments. In any event, um, so Colorforth, um, as folks know. Uh, uses uh, color to distinguish uh, certain operations like defining a word. So here we're defining square and then we just provide its definition uh, with uh, compiling each word at a time. And then we uh, can then execute that word uh, using yet another color type. And um, really what's what's nice about Colorforth is that you can, you can keep things even simpler and you can uh, make sure you understand all the pieces. Um, and, and I wanted to, uh, for, for this particular implementation, 
uh, focus on making something that uh, was maybe a little bit more than a toy, but but we'll see. And uh, as I guess folks have noticed with some of my fourths, I tend to try to start with a, a small kernel oftentimes in C, bootstrap, and then get into fourth as quickly as possible. So, um, and I, I'm still just calling it CF for now, but uh, I, I probably need a better, better name as there's starting to be a profusion of these. Um, for the moment, I had, my implementation is runnable on Windows, um, but I'm trying to keep that complexity kind of all pushed to one side because uh, I'm really just using Windows as a host to get me an environment where I can access the keyboard and the and uh, and the screen. But uh, really, I just want to do raw uh, x86 64 uh, instructions. And uh, what I have in mind is maybe uh, to make this uh, UEFI bootable because in a UEFI environment. There are also uh, some uh, uh, drivers that are in place that open up access to a wide range of screen types and a wide range of, of keyboards and so on. Um, and one other reason that I've structured things uh, to sort of get into fourth quickly is that I'm able to use that to defer most of the re register convention choices uh, to, to code that's in fourth. Um, and then the other kind of slightly weird thing with this implementation is I've, I've ended up using a, what's called an x32 addressing scheme where you use 32-bit addresses but 64-bit data. Uh, so the, the, the data stacks and so on are all 64-bit, uh, but when you do loads and stores, they're 32-bits. Um, addresses are, are uh, done as uh, indexes uh, multiplied by, by you know, four bytes. Um, and this keeps things compatible with um, uh, sort of Chuck's uh, and, and Howard's uh, color forth encoding convention. And it also uh, is helpful because a lot of the things that you want to access, uh, like pixels, are, are oftentimes 32 bits. And so all very useful. Um, I've tried to use Chuck's quirks as much as I can sort of bear. Uh, some of them are, are a little hard to get in your head, uh, things like minus sign for invert or uh, or as XOR. Um, if you've seen some of my prior talks, a thing that I realized I had mushed together um, in my understanding of, uh, of the existing uh, of Chuck's uh, color forth was uh, his use of uh, if and, and minus if. It turns out that on the Pentium version, he sort of leans into using uh, the flags on the system rather than uh, the top of stack, whereas I had looked at some of the, C, uh, the, C, uh, the GA144 documentation and assumed that that was sort of uh, the definitive behavior where the top of the stack is used uh, to make a decision. But it, it turns out that in addition to not having if uh, consume a value from the stack, it, uh, at least in his Pentium implementation, it's typically looking at either the zero, you know, the zero flag or the sign flag. Um, bunch of the other conventions. Uh, load and store being word sized is actually pretty handy and grows on you. I've, I've tried to use an, an A register as well. Um, and, and then there's also this transition of emitting a literal and immediate uh, transition from uh, immediate words to, uh, to compile words. And um, so the way that Chuck built his color forth, I think, is that he, he wrote his editor and his, his core system in assembler and then uh, built up the rest of the system in fourth, sort of once he had an editor. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach. I, I devised a text syntax that uh, lets me uh, commit my changes to, uh, to a source control repository uh, and use a conventional editor. Uh, and then I've written a converter that converts in and out of the binary format. Um, my eventual goal, and I'm actually at the, the stage now, is to not typically be editing things in Vim, but to uh, have this as a way to, to keep, uh, to, to be able to continue to use uh, conventional version control. Um, and then using that, uh, that minimal color forth, uh, or sorry, then, then using a minimal color forth that I implement in a, in a very simple C interpreter, uh, I'm able to bootstrap color forth and then the rest of the system is, is itself written in color forth. And then I, I provide a, a few sort of syscall-like entry points back into, uh, into the, the Windows host environment to, to do things like uh, to bit blip uh, uh, the screen and to get keyboard events uh, and very small handful, like five or six. Um, and, and then I wrote an editor, which I'll, I'll be showing off. 
Um, the, the color fourth encoding, I've kept the binary encoding where uh, strings are encoded using 28 bits of um, work, uh, sort of a, 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 a variable length encoded characters and then a, a, a four bit color tag. Numbers uh, share the color tag, but then also use a single bit to indicate hex and, and uh, so on. Um, and then my converter, I used uh, the convention of a prefix to, to specify uh, transitions to the different words. This makes it possible to, to load up uh, in, in Vim with a certain syntax plugin and be able to see things. I've started using this less as I now have a, a Colorforth editor in Colorforth, and there's a bunch of prefixes that I use to mark decimal and hex. So all of this is at this point kind of a little bit vestigial, but, but also I, I've kept it around because I want to be able to uh, have uh, snapshots that I, uh, that I can save to version control. Um, I've uh, used the, uh, the color mapping and I'll, I'll toggle the, the color coding here just so folks, folks that are familiar with conventional coding, uh, the, the coloring scheme. I kept the uh, the tags more or less the same. I've actually followed through on dropping the um, the uppercase and uh, and uh, all caps uh, comments, and uh, more or less retain the scheme as is. Um, let me flip back, and then uh, I've noticed there's actually two different character sets that are out there. Um, Howard had actually ended up using uh, a um, the, the, this character 41 as a, a colon, um, but I've kept it as a, as a tick, uh, which I noticed that the array fourth implementation seems to use because it's uh, useful to be able to do apostrophes and, and so on. Uh, the converter uh, is a beast of a thing considering that it's just converting from a binary format to text and back and forth, but it's 253 lines of Python and supports both uh, you know, Chuck and Howard's images, and I use that to sort of vet that I got the encoding right. Um, and uh, you can you can run the thing at the command line. Um, I made a plugin, as I mentioned, for Vim to be able to to show the highlights uh, or show the colors as I edit things. Um, and then to bootstrap, what I do is I start with a uh, a C interpreter that only knows how to execute words. Uh, out of the dictionary. So it understands the dictionary format enough to be able to traverse the dictionary, uh, look for a word, and then it invokes it using a, uh, a thunk that it assumes is also available uh, in the dictionary. So it looks up the C to fourth thunk, uses that to call any words that it wants to execute. And that thunk makes the transition from the, uh, the, the standard C calling conventions for x86-64, which have particular registers that are sort of well known, and transitions into uh, the register convention that I use inside of the system. Uh, and that let, handles both transitioning in and transitioning back out. Um, I, I actually start Colorforth up on a separate thread because eventually once the system is running, I don't want to ever leave Colorforth. So I transition in and then just stay in uh, after it sort of passed the bootstrapping stages. And then using this, this sort of C harness that knows how to just uh, execute words only, I then implement uh, compiled words, which the, the, the harness knows how to use a separate thunk to, uh, to invoke based on the color tag. And then lastly, a, a compiled numbers uh, thunk. Um, well, I should mention, um, I, I don't actually implement the, uh, the wide uh, number words that, that uh, Chuck has for, for big numbers. Uh, and this means that I can't have constants that are larger than uh, basically uh, seven uh, hex digits, or what fits in the, uh, it fits inside of uh, a packed word. And this is just another simplification. So, um, and then, uh, I build up all the core words in the macros. I implement color words and dispatch, and then I, uh, I transition into the machine code uh, interpreter, and it, it runs from there. Um, and so these are the only words that the harness understands, the sort of compiling in a, uh, one, two, or three 
uh, byte value. It knows how to do a load and a through operation. It knows how to switch between the two different vocabularies, the fourth vocabulary and the macro vocabulary. It knows how to do numbers. And then I, I found that for debugging, it was absolutely necessary to have a, a print operation, which just pops up a message box. And it's occasionally useful to see the, the here value. Um, this is uh, one about a third of the uh, of the interpreter. This is the part that uh, implements the dispatch to those different words. So sort of complicated, but not too bad. The colorful words are encoded just directly here. I, I use my converter offline to uh, take these words here and, and, and convert them. Um, I've kept Chuck's register convention with a few twists. I use uh, RAX and RSI, the same as he does for the stack. This is, ends up being surprisingly handy. I still have mine to eventually switch to uh, something where I can have a wraparound stack the way Dr. Ting did with a 64-bit, um, six, 64 values and a data stack. But I, uh, I have found that uh, Chuck's choice of uh, RAX and RSI is handy because then you can use uh, the, uh, the string words uh, and they have some nice properties in terms of not perturbing uh, the, uh, the flags. Um, I use RDI as a code heap pointer, which is a little bit wasteful, uh, but, but ends up also simplifying the bootstrapping. And then I use R8 because I'm on, remember, X64 uh, to keep a pointer to uh, a bunch of the internal variables shared with the host harness, including the place that I park the stack pointer when I transition in and out. I use the um, uh, RSP as the, as the uh, uh, return stack pointer, obviously, and share that with the C stack. And then, um, and then I also use, similar to Chuck, use RDX as, as the A register. And so I've got um, a little bit of a structure that I, that I keep uh, around for uh, uh, interacting between the two layers. Um, won't go into it, but there's a bunch of uh, the entry points to the different system calls. The dictionary, I use a slightly different format from Chuck rather than using two separate arrays with words and addresses because I'm operating in 64 bits, uh, it, it ended up being handier to have 32 bits for the address and 32 bits for the word, uh, and then be able to interleave them and then walk down a single, uh, a single dictionary going up to a zero to mark the, the front. Um, the editor is modal. Uh, it's inspired by sort of a mixture of VI and, and Chuck's uh, a color fourth editor. Uh, it, similarly, it does word at a time entry. Um, there are things like color toggling and search uh, that are sort of specific to editing Colorforth. Um, it borrows the, the wonderful idea that, that's in the Colorforth editor for doing the clipboard as a stack, where when you delete, delete a word, uh, it gets pushed into a stack, and if you paste, or uh, you can, you can uh, pop it back off of the stack, which works quite nicely. Um, so on the keyboard that I use is a little non-conventional. I reassign some of the, the typical keys um, so that I, ha I don't have to do any modifiers. So there's no shift keys for anything, um, but I do use a QWERTY keyboard um, and uh, I, I've replaced some of the keys like brackets and, and slash and so on with uh, the characters in the Colorforth character set. Uh, so it looks like this. And then in the editor, I, I use these same keys, but uh, in a modal interface to, to let you uh, do different operations. So there's movement keys uh, mimicking the VI movement keys um, there's keys for moving page at a time, keys for toggling uh, shadow blocks, which I'm reluctantly using. I've never been too much of a fan, but I decided to cave and give it a, give it a solid try. Uh, toggling uh, uh, blue words on and off, although they're not blue in the color scheme that I've chosen, as you'll see in a moment. And then uh, words to input the different colors. Uh, and then uh, the uh, words to toggle a color, words to change the base, and then uh, copy-paste. I borrow the convention from Windows of X, C, and V uh, being copy and paste, except there's just a single key press in that mode. A um, couple random things I'll mention. Um, I've struggled a bit with magenta variables. They, they have a lot of quirks as it stands. Um, magenta variables have the, the property that uh, one really weird quirk is that they uh, re you really can't give them very long names because they make the assumption that the, uh, the next uh, word over is the word uh, in question. The other kind of inconvenience I've noticed implementing an editor 
in Colorforth is that if I have uh, magenta variables in the source code, now when I move them, uh, I'm potentially damaging the editor and confusing the thing that I'm using live. Uh, so for this reason, I, I ended up more often uh, typically using uh, a conventional, and I should just, flip, I'm gonna flip the colors here so that we, you can, those that are familiar with the conventional colors, um, I, doing uh, a definition uh, followed by a yellow word to put something into a, a data, uh, a, a data um, heap, and then uh, using, uh, using a, a green word to then uh, transition that into a literal. And that ends up being more convenient because the variable isn't sitting in line in the source block. I, I'm still attempt, tempted by the, some of the desirable properties of magenta variables in terms of being able to save and load uh, their state in, directly in the source code, but I found in practice it, it's, it's very tedious. Um, and let's see, um, I've also found the flag conditionals a little bit hard to get sort of in your head. Um, it's, it's sort of nice that they leave the stack alone, but it's, it's hard to compose them because now you're sort of dealing with the flags. Uh, I, I think I may in the future give some sub talk just on this topic, it's, it's kind of fascinating, but um, you know, you, you end up with these strange idioms like uh, wanting to do uh, an or drop to, to check to see if a value doesn't match something or um, oftentimes uh, you'll, you'll end up, uh, you know, having challenges composing things. So you could do a pattern like uh, dupe three or drop uh, and then a conditional and then another layer to kind of compose conditions. So there's, there's some quirks to it that I, I feel like I haven't um, really gotten comfortable with. And I think an extra quirk uh, that I found is that when it comes to signed and unsigned comparisons, um, Chuck uses this word less, which he actually defines with a whole bunch of, uh, uh, it's actually a whole uh, chunk of code that manipulates flags. It's actually a kind of overly complex and yet minus if uh, works most of the time. So there's a whole sort of interesting sub question around how to do, um, how to deal with, with uh, flags and how many of them are sort of minimally necessary. So anyways, I'm gonna go do a demo because that's the main thing I wanted to, to show off in this talk. Um, so I've got the, the system here and it, it's bootable like this. And of course it decides to open on the other monitor. Let me open this up. And so here it is. <clears throat> um, it has um, an interactive editor uh, similar to uh, the conventional one in Colorforth. There are shadow blocks where I've got my to-do list. Um, and uh, you, can, you can do sort of conventional things. So if I wanted to enter a definition, I can hit a key, enter square and dupe and multiply, and then I have square, that type of thing. Um, and then I have my, um, my, my uh, stack for copy paste and I can readily copy paste things around, oops. Um, and uh, just to give a brief tour of the system, um, so here's that C to fourth word uh, that is all just sort of a bunch of assembly done in line to, to be the thunk transition into color fourth from the, um, the C calling convention. And then I bootstrap with uh, a word that knows how to compile a word that compiles one byte. Uh, and that gives me just enough to be able to implement semicolon, which then gives me just enough to be able to implement compiling uh, a 32-bit uh, value into the code dictionary, and then I'm able to implement uh, comma compile, at which point now I can compile words, although I don't use that quite yet because I then go ahead and implement uh, uh, the rex pref w prefix. I do implement this peculiar word nip dupe, which I then use to implement dupe, um, and then I'm able to implement literal and now I can compile literal, so I actually have kind of most of the conventional things. And I'll, I'll toggle the, the color scheme here just so folks get a visual sense of that. I've got a couple other things. By the way, I've noticed that the more I've used these other color schemes, I, I'm starting to find the conventional color for scheme a little bit visually harsh, as, as you may find. I've also got a black and white scheme in here, by the way. Um, and uh, let's see. Let me go on. Um, and then I go implement a bunch of macros uh, similar to what Chuck does for all of the core things. Um, and 
uh, more macros and more macros and then the conditionals and uh, I then copy a bunch of them over to uh, compiled mm -hmm. copies. And uh, at that point, I, I go ahead and I, uh, I implement uh, a few more things, some uh, thunks to be able to transition and call in to see this word invoke, which looks very complicated. Uh, does the reverse trampoline of getting back into uh, a Windows call from inside a fourth, uh, but passing along a bunch of parameters which allows me to implement a handful of system calls, uh, including things like posting a message to the, to the main thread, getting an event, and uh, reading and writing some things. And then this is, now I'm implementing the, the Colorforth dispatch in just two, two blocks. So this is an implementation of defining words, compiling words, compiling numbers, executing words, executing numbers, um, postponing words that you know the conventional cyan words variables and then an, a none slot and then that lets me define this table to dispatch uh, the 16 different tags and then I can have a loop that evaluates things and I should mention by the way I've avoided using um, most of the conventional looping structures I've ended up using a uh, tail call for virtually for basically everything so I, I don't even have a for loop in this uh, the system. Everything is done with uh, relying on doing semicolon followed uh, or a word followed by semicolon, which gets converted into a jump. Um, I define blocks as being multiples of 256 uh, plus some value, magic value outside of from the trampoline uh, variable area, and then uh, and then that lets me implement load and through a second time inside of the interpreter which now lets me start the main interpreter. And from this block on, everything is now just running in Colorforth. C is out of it, except for thunking over to, to draw pixels on the screen and get key, key events. Um, and then I implement uh, a bunch of additional stuff. I implement uh, uh, box drawing here, a, a stack to keep my, uh, a, a graphic stack to keep some of the state that I want to be able to toggle back and forth. And then you'll notice this terrible font I'm using, and I do intend to have a better font soon, but for now I've actually got, this, this screen actually defines this font. And if you can imagine, uh, the font is, uh, is implemented in uh, 25 bits. Uh, so there's four bits horizontally and six bits, or six, four pixels horizontally and six bits vertically. Um, and then the uppermost bit uh, will optionally clone the, the, the rightmost column onto the leftmost column, which for a few characters like the letter M and the letter W and the letter X give me a wide character so that I can get some of those shapes right. So just a barely readable font. And, uh, and then I have words to implement, printing of letters, and uh, I have a mapping from the key, the key codes in Windows to uh, to color for earth colors, and I have uh, printing of numbers, uh, printing of, let's see, this is uh, sort of code for the managing the input loop, um, and drawing of a prompt, and uh, this is, sorry, this is printing of letters and numbers, this is the input prompt, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And then uh, here's the editor um, with each key sort of specified uh, and its behavior. And then I hook it up in, in or sorry, this is a little bit more to the editor. And then here's the main dispatch table for navigation in the editor. And here's the color themes and a bunch of fun stuff. Anyways, let me show you some cool things you can do. Um, Here's a, here's a fun word. One of the things you can do with Colorforth is you can have inline uh, words that are uh, in conventional Colorforth, they are uh, blue, I'll, I'll show it here. And what they do is they, they get executed in the editor. And so here I have a word called forth that just draws the Colorforth logo inline. And uh, you can inject those characters where you like. Um, I have a, uh, here's a, 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 a text dumper. So I, I have a dumper that can uh, 
I can view uh, the raw bytes in memory and uh, move around and see those. Let me go back into the editor here. Um, and then I start up the world. Let me show one other thing and then I will take some questions. Um, so uh, here's some more fun stuff with that color fourth word. I've got some uh, words to change the font size so you can do fun, interesting things with font size. Um, and then here's a couple here. Um, I've got an implementation of factorial that I need to actually load this block. Um, and then it will sort of print that. But you can do actually even better if you go into this block. Um, I load it and go into the editor. I, this uh, prints the squares, uh, but prints them inline using uh, blue words. And then a uh, similar story, but I, I was inspired by the use of Fibonacci to do the Fibonacci words numbers and here they are in line in the blue word and with that i will take some questions yes i do have a question uh what is your terminal emulator uh so this is implemented in colorforth so this this is uh this this uh the outer code in windows uh is is giving it uh the opportunity to draw into a uh, just a windows uh, of, into into a window uh, from a piece of memory at startup the windows harness will actually allocate a gigantic chunk of virtual memory uh, I think a gigabyte of memory way way more than I need and then uh, what it, what's happening is that for every frame uh, it's uh, it needs to let me go show the code here um, it's calling into this. Uh, this flip method, which does a post message over to the to the main thread in Windows, and then copies uh, that buffer to the screen. And so I'm actually drawing the pixels. That's and that is why I have this terrible font is because I am actually implementing the font in Colorful. So the entire environment you're seeing here, with the exception of the the startup of the window and the initial bootstrapping is, is all done uh, in the color forth that, that is in the environment. So. so in essence, you implemented your own terminal emulator. Indeed. Wow. That is cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Hmm. Flipping the flipping the color schemes here. Um, let's see what are what are some other fun. Um, the um, uh, one of the one of the things that uh, one of the things that I think is is also kind of nice about having a custom editor is the ability to toggle uh, toggle things out. Like suppose I wanted to comment out this word, I can just toggle each of these to a comment. Um, and then I can toggle them back. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you change the color scheme for this? Because I personally find that, let's say, bright green is more readable than, let's say, dark blue. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the color scheme is actually defined, uh, let me find the block here. The, yeah, there's, there's a, a notion of, um, Toggle, there's a button that toggles, uh, the Q button toggles color schemes. And I, I put in these, these, uh, these four color schemes, but you're, you could certainly add others. And I, I actually vary several things within each color scheme. So you'll notice that in, uh, in this, this scheme that uses the, the long uh, colorblind themes, they're kind of a more muted set of colors. And then some of the things are bold. And then in this one, I decided to do, this is the conventional color for colors uh, and I picked wider, wider characters. And then in this purely black and white theme, um, I've got uh, sort of bold, large characters for the uh, definitions and then uh, narrower ones for uh, yellow and then a sort of a gray for the others. And so you can kind of pick and choose. And actually, let me show in all of the theme. Oops, in, and so in this theme, for example, I do, um, 
I do uh, italic for the, um, it's more of an oblique actually, technically, uh, for these. And I keep that also in the, in the, the more conventional scheme. So um, <laughs> I, I initially, yeah, I share your sense that initially, uh, you know, the conventional themes are, are, uh, are nice. I, I really do find this, this you'll, I, I encourage folks that are playing around with color forths to play around the themes. At first, I, I was like, oh, you know, this is a, a sad muted color palette. And then I gradually grew used to this one. And then I got it, started playing with this one and, and it grows on you. It's sort of now, now even the other one feels a little harsh. So I find that it's, it, it's what you adapt to, but uh, I, what I really need to do is run this all by Dennis Roofer because I, one of the things I wanted to do with the scheme was to, to find one that would made this a little bit more accessible to him uh, without, without resorting to sort of introducing stray punctuation characters and so on. Other questions? Yes. Uh, can you maintain these codes without any comments of sorts? Uh, this is a good question. So um, I I do feel like the comment, the level of comments I have in here, and if you go, if I swing back to my first block, uh, make shadow blocks more detailed. One of the things uh, that, that Chuck does in his fourths is he will use um, he uses shadow blocks, and I'm toggling here back and forth between the shadow block for this one, and you'll see here it gives a, a commented description of the block, or maybe a better example would be this one, where it's got sort of the comments hidden away. Um, I personally have never, not typically been a big fan of this style of thing with the shadow blocks, but I noticed that it is, uh, it is kind of nice to be able to sort of see things in a mode where the comments are largely absent, although here there are actually are comments for the to show the x86 instructions. Um, but I I share your sense that like uh, one of the nice things about being able to have comments interleaved is actually to have these these nice white comments in line. And so, for example, uh, let's see the uh, the stack effect here. Uh, following Chuck's convention, I put the the the, the stack effect. In the shadow block rather than in the in the definition, I'm still on the fence about whether whether it's good or bad. Well, ask me again when I've not touched some section of it for a month, and then and then try to look at it and understand it. So, good question, <laughs> Christian. Uh, yes, Brad. Uh, my question is very basic. I've seen so many people talking about color color fort. And they all say it's a very clever implementation of Fort. And I'd like to know what makes it so clever. Why is it so better so I would, than any other implementation? Ah, so so I think let me see if I can capture it with with a uh, sort of a visual picture. So this this screen def defines a bunch of dispatch words where, where these are just, you, know, you can think of them like a conventional form with colon definitions for the meanings of a few of the different, uh, of, of this, each of the, the major colors. And then you just have a table. And so what's con what I think what is appealing to implementers of, of fourths about color forth is that color forth really is just load a value from memory, look at the bottom four bits, dispatch that word based on the bottom four bits in the the tag based on this this very sort of simple sort of definition of what how to interpret each tag and then that is your entire fourth implementation and so in some sense like these two screens is the is the entire implementation of the system and so i think it's 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 appealing because if you compare it to a conventional fourth you oftentimes are sort of chased in a conventional fourth you're chasing your tail fighting with the challenge of parsing the source code at the same time that you're trying to interpret the source code. But with Colorforth, the parsing work gets done in the editor, and now all that you're left to do in the interpreter is just tear off a tag, execute it, tear off the tag, execute it. And, and so it's a very, very simple uh, sort of core system, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Very great explanation. Thank you, yeah. Brad. 
Brad, I have another question. Uh, Chuck uh, uh, also experimented with uh, keyboard layout and things like this. Do you stick to his uh, way of uh, assigning the keys, or maybe I, I, I do it. not fully. So I, I'm not. I'm not a fan of the. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, uh, Dvorak, uh, and, mm -hmm. and so what I I do have a QWERTY style scheme, but I do I do use modal editors. So there are some similarities. So for example. In, in Chuck's editor, he also uses a row of uh, keys for motion, but I he actually flips the ordering of those keys versus VI, which I bugs me to no end. And so in VI, uh, that row of keys, the up and the down are reversed <laughs> of what Chuck uses. So I have flipped them to the VI direction because I'm not likely to be able to change, but I've kept the convention that the row, uh, the, the key to move a page forward and backward is below the, the key to move left and right. Um, I have uh, kept, I moved to where the shadow block key is, uh, and I think aside from that, it's, and I kept the space bar and, uh, as, the, uh, as the terminator key, and that actually really grows on you. That I think of all the things in the Color Fourth Editor, that idea of use, you know, uh, using space bar as sort of uh, an enter key uh, mm -hmm. is actually a, a very effective thing. So I would say mostly not except for arrow movement a little bit and, and the space bar. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you very much. Yeah, Philip, no, George, George, Philip, you uh, have a question. Yeah. yeah, hello. I have a question, Brad. So is it is there a way to export, import block? Uh, like how to share your code? Your uh, ah, yeah, code? so uh, actually, that you're reminding me of a thing I forgot to demo. So I, I actually have uh, over here in this files one and two, uh, the um, uh, I actually have both uh, Chuck, one of Chuck's color fourths and then uh, Howard's. So let me let me I can go ahead and load those. I'm going to load file number two uh, into block two hundred, and I will add I will load to a bunch of bytes of it. That's how big it actually is. And then if I go to edit that, oops. So if I skip forward here, so this is the raw junk at the front of Chuck uh, uh, Howard's implementation. And then I don't know what's going on there. There's some interesting things. If you get far enough forward, you get an hour. This is actually Howard's uh, uh, Howard's color for implementation loaded in, in here. Uh, and so he's got uh, a bunch of Block. So he's got quite a bit of code that he he implemented over the years uh, to do all sorts of things. So you can uh, you can load and save blocks that way. And then uh, in general, the system there's a there's a save operation that will save uh, the current uh, the current set of things. I'm still sort of working on that because I'm this all of these I rely on transitioning out to Windows to do the the reads and the writes um, for it. And I'm trying to keep as strong as I can a partition where I don't want to. I don't want to create a very detailed contract between Windows and, and Fourth. I want to basically treat it like like it's just a bootstrapper. Because uh, as I mentioned, I, I have I have in mind the idea of uh, switching this to being something that you could actually boot up as an OS uh, and use UEFI to provide uh, the screen and the keyboard and the disk. Mm -hmm. um, although it, it's it's frightening. I you know uh, I one of my uh, laptops recently did an upgrade. It, it it is amazing how complicated the BIOSes has, BIOSes have gotten now that they have UEFI. They're practically uh, an operating system of their own in just in the BIOS now. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But actually, you you may have had a slightly different meaning, which is the idea of importing and exporting to a more conventional form. Um, the oh, I, I mentioned I have this convert converter. Uh, let me let me. Show that very briefly. So the um, Python, yeah. So so uh, the Python converter uh, can be used. And so, for example, here is um, here is the same boot blocks viewed as text. Um, this is just the color you're seeing is just syntax highlighting from a, a Vim plugin that I made. And so you've got the same content, but you'll notice that there's these uh, uh, prefixes that specify the different color transitions. So the, uh, this uh, colorify colorize utility, uh, oops, which uh, will let you convert back and forth between 
uh, color for blocks and text, um, which makes it nice to be able to check things in and out. Right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. What, what, yeah. what good progress. I've, I, I, I've, I've seen your talk at uh, Silicon Valley Fig uh, a month ago or something like this, and you made a huge progress. Wow. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. All May right. I ask one last question? Sure. Christian, welcome. Uh, Brad, the original color for could boot from a floppy disk directly for on 8086 hardware uh, could yours your implementation work without windows and boot directly from the hardware so so that, that so yes and no the 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 challenge is that the uh, so in its current form it, it, it there's a windows dependency but i've designed the the that transition to rely on windows very little um, the, there would need to be um, a little bit of a, of a, uh, uh, an outer thunk to transition in that would need to be implemented uh, to, to boot up. And I think one other challenge, and this is one of the reasons I've been thinking about UEFI, is that uh, a, an issue that Chuck ran into with his fourth is that he ended up having to um, assume particular hardware in order to be able to implement an assembler his own loader, whereas there's a range of different graphics hardware out there, a range of different keyboards. UEFI provides an environment where there are some very simple syscalls that will let you uh, switch graphics modes, let you access the keyboard and so on. So uh, I think that there is a fairly straightforward path to being able to boot using the UEFI BIOS bootloader. Um, but Chuck is doing sort of the booting off of the, the conventional, like classic uh, BIOS, which really gives you nothing other than loading one block of uh, uh, code. And for that, there's quite a bit of work that you would have to do that I, I have not done. So, so yes, if it was a, a sort of a more complex bootloader like UEFI, which are, is, is available on basically all conventional machines, but no, if it was on a, on a sort of an older style by, uh, classic BIOS. But but none of that is working yet. So so you know, grain of salt. Like I, I I'm speculating about a thing I have, have not yet hit all of the obstacles of trying. Thanks. All right. I think we are at it. Thank you very much again. And um, yeah, it's Cornelius time, I think. Good. Uh, Perfect. Talk about the RTX 2000 simulator that uh, you discovered. Yeah. Yep. Let's have a quick, well, kind of quick walk through through this thing. Oh, good grief! Zoom shared the interface. Uh, Change the interface again. Okay. Here we go. Um, good. RTX 2000. Quick recap. Um, it's a descendant of the. Novix 4000 CPU. If you look at the CPU architecture and the command set, that will become um, immediately apparent. A couple documents describing this. Of course, there have been a few things bolted on. The Novix addressed 64 kilobytes, um, kilowords. Memory is 16 bits wide of which the first 32 could be used for programming. We'll take a look at why in here in a minute. The RTX lineup shares this. Um, other differences are, we'll see that later on the code. Um, the RTX can address one megabyte of 500, 512 kilo words of RAM of memory, courtesy of a segment register, uh, very much the same concept like the 8088 uh, brought to market. Beyond that, well, the CPU has the usual registers, 
we know already seen with the Novix top of stack, next of stack, um, in currently executed instruction, the program counter, status register, top of return stack, and the rocket sign stuff for multi-step divide and the square root register. So very small register set, easily internally addressed by index. Um, what else do we have? As before with the Novix, instructions are directly encoded. Each bit in an instruction word uh, does something uh, directly in the CPU. So you have a class which identifies what kind of operation you're executing. You have something for the ALU. You have a subclass that specifies what you exactly within that class you intend to do. The return from subroutine bit is still present just as it was in the Novix, a return from subroutine therefore executes in zero time if you package it in with another instruction. And you have five data bits, which can be used for a shift or short literal. That would be a constant to load into a register, for instance, or part of a memory address. We then have classes, uh, class specifications, and so on and so forth. We look at command words. If the top bit is zero, the rest is an address, and we jump to a subroutine. Uh, that means that subroutine addresses can only be 15 bits long, not 16. It means your uh, subroutine calls end up in the lower half of memory. Uh, what else? The branches are still there. Branch jumps have to take place in the same four kilobyte segment. Um, yeah, it goes on like that. With all of these, look at ALU operations, 16 different uh, types of these up to. With that, your list of available instructions is one printed page long such as your subroutine call is one by itself, your subroutine return, well, highest bit is one because it's not a call and the return bit is set to one. You can piggyback that on pretty much everything else. Beyond that, most, uh, most low level fourth instruction, something that you would elsewhere encode as a, an assembly primitive are just a word. The CPU comes in different flavors. Um, one of them is radiation hardened. And as a consequence, they have been used in a number of spacecraft. Uh, the last one was the um, Rosetta uh, Philae, uh, Philae mission to 67P. The rest of that name I can't quite pronounce. Comet, where the lander, the comet lander contained two of these things. And I think the mothership had either four or six for various purposes. Um, there is a simulator for this thing. Um, and it makes sense to take a look at the README. Um, Written, it was written by Phil Copeman. He's still around. Uh, he is still at uh, CMU, Char Charles Mellon University. Um, the, Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he wrote this thing while he was at Harris. So technically, that's still kind of copyrighted. But since this was done in the 90s, I'm fairly sure uh, one could argue that um, Harris has lost all interest. The CPU apparently is still available. Uh, comes with comes with both source code and an app forth 
also on source code and as firmware that this runs on. Typically on Linux, you would expect a configure, make, make, install um, script. Uh, sure. Not exactly. The only thing that there is is a make file, and that make file is primitive. Uh, the only thing that's really, really system dependent is how the um, keyboard or the console interface gets turned to um, character IO, not line by line like it would be in a shell. Yeah, it's fairly primitive, fairly simple. Um, couple differences, as I said, between the Novix and this thing. As far as hardware goes, one that you actually have to pay attention to is that you have a segment register. The um, the app fourth doesn't use that. It all happens within the segment zero, so the first segment. Um, I've not experimented with that just yet. Uh, your mileage will vary. Uh, documentation is exists, but it's kind of finite. But hey, that's what source code is for. To compile that thing, just run a make, and it creates your simulator, and it creates a bin to hex utility that you will need when you compile your own, when you rebuild uh, app forth to create that, to turn the bin file that comes out of the, of the executable uh, into an Intel um, hex dump or Intel hex format that gets read on startup. The other thing worth mentioning, there's a script called run, which invokes the application followed by the hex file of, um, of your um, firmware. So if we run this thing, this is my version. It spits out all that hexadecimal that it has been reading. And we are up. Let's see if anything works. Well, that looks promising. Let's make a word definition. Same thing. If we do a word, a wait, wait, that's uppercase. Okay, let's try that again. Um, add three four three four plus dot semicolon. Do a words. Do a words. You got to be kidding me. Okay, fine. That was my very first change that I had to do to make this work. The problem with this thing is, or was, 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 that this was done for Turbo C, so something that runs on MS-DOS. Nee, not Turbo C. Turbo C is the name of the constant in the code, but it was compiled with Borland C. Um, I have never used that. And I'm wondering if that's a Windows application or if that required DOS. If we look at the uh, source code, there's a constant called Turbo C. It's set to one. So this is compiled for PC. Set this to zero if you want to run this thing on a spark station. This constant is used um, if you for the output file name and a couple of other things, such as uh, how uh, end of line looks like. So carriage return line feed or just a backslash n. Um, where else do we use that? Yes, the implementation of CR, carriage return, 
no, sorry, the definition of words, multi-line output normally, it checks if that thing is um, set to one or not. And if so, it ex executes a thing called pause. And that's it. Other And afterwards, it gives you the next word. Pause just does just that. It waits for carriage return. Now, if you start out with this thing, it will not recompile itself. And this is not because there's something broken in AppForth itself. AppForth itself will compile just fine. What does not compile just, or what uh, what is missing, is that the executable, that the runtime um, is missing all any all and any kind of disk access support. So if you run the original, let's do that real quick. It's over here. Let's run a make. Let's run a run. Let's see if this works. We are still alive. Not bad. If we do a load and we load an app forth dot forth. We get an error message and this thing terminates. These errors are deadly because if you get an error within your um, within the simulator itself because you did something illegal, uh, it's over. So um, if we take a look at the source code, uh, sorry, if we take it, so if we t look at the firmware of AppForce, we find out that this thing pauses, which makes sense in a DOS machine, because if this is truly running under DOS, or if this was done in Turbo C, then you will, uh, uh, then you don't have, uh, if your output scrolls by fast enough, hitting pause might be too late, you might not see stuff, and you cannot scroll back in your output buffer unless you're running under windows so this carriage return thing in a way it makes sense but you need to have this compiled and you would like to work properly with this thing with this uh, uh, environment so the very first thing that you would like to see this leave is the um is this this carriage return to go from enter to enter to enter um, that is comparatively easy to do within the hex dump itself. You can find the address of pause where the code itself starts. Uh, a little bit of digging finds that it is at offset 12127A hex. And you just replace the very first word of the pause implementation with a return from subroutine, which renders pause useless for all intents and purposes, but it will do the trick. We compile that and we run that. And now if we do a words, this scrolls by just fine. And if we had a scroll bar on the side and this wasn't full screen mode, we could now go back and look at this. That's the first thing that I've changed to make this work. And it's a hack. But we can now recompile, or we could start looking into recompiling the firmware into new firmware hex file to load. For that to work, we have to um, we have to add disk primitives which gets us to the point where we would like to find out how the disk is accessed. If we think back to the Novix CPU, uh, the Novix sends a hex three, hex zero three, followed by a block number. If the highest bit, uh, the highest bit of the block number, two bytes, 16 bit block number, no, 15 bit block number, if the highest bit decides if that is a read operation or a write operation, and that works like a charm over a serial line. 
which makes sense because most of these Novix boards, they were, well, there was no console, there was no screen, no keyboard attached. So you'd use the terminal and you relied on the host talking to the board to do disk IO and send data across the bus. Good. In this case, there is a similar mechanism, but it implements it drastically different. Instead of writing to a serial port, what this implementation does is what this emulator or this board simulation does is that it writes um, a command word out to a serial port. Command start with hex zero, not with hex three. So this implementation could well host the Novix's block IO, which isn't, as far as I know, it's not here. I haven't found it yet. What command does, it sends a hex zero out, followed by whatever command you put on to the stack, identified by an integer. These commands are interesting in as much they all follow very much the same pattern. An open file, for instance, contains a file name and the length of it, and it um, returns a handle. The handle is what we will later see the same thing as you would expect from a, an open uh, the the C or the Lib C function open returns an integer. They use that straight um, within this environment as to reference a file. So they put hex twenty onto the stack, send that out. Then they transmit the length of the file name. Um, XMTS was, it sends out, XMTS sends a string. So we first send the length of the string, then we send the string itself. Then we go into a function that's called receive the result. And that's it. Ha, by the way, is die if error. Uh, there are a number of primitives that deal with files. So this thing, this particular environment does not implement block IO, it implements full-blown file IO. So it has an open is for a read, a create is for a write, a delete blows the file away. Then we can read lines from a file and that will become important later when we start compiling our own firmware because as this thing does not have a block interface, it reads line by line and hands them off to the fourth environment as if they came from the keyboard. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. As far as uh, I.O. goes, now, if we look at XMIT, XMT, where is it? XMT, never mind the begin until part here. What this thing does is that it write, um, receive and ex uh, transmit right directly into a CPU register. I've never seen any of the boards that are being simulated here. So either somebody bolted on some extra hardware on the outside that gets exercised whenever you write something to a CPU register, or um, it is a concession to a simulated environment that catches a read uh, to this register or from this register or a write to this register that then goes out and triggers an external action. 
The simulation environment strongly suggests the latter. If an actual board did that, I don't know, I don't have the board. If we take a look at the implementation and how this is being done, we have somewhere in here functions that implement a host read, which would be a read from hex 19, or a host write from hex 19, that open a file, read a file, do something dot to files, and so on and so forth. All of these invoke a function. There is a token, a numerical token to function association, which has to match whatever app forth implements. This goes down to the point that you can actually return commands. Some of these I have yet to implement. This particular environment contains what's uh, required to um, recompile the firmware. So for instance, an open file, remember, you pull this out of the simulated environment byte by byte. You do not get to read a memory region, though that would be implementable, that you have a memory region that then gets uh, handed off to the um, emulator, which would more or less uh, sound like dual ported memory. The host reads memory that the guest uh, has to put commands together in that was not done here. And that's probably a good thing as we'll, we'll see in a future talk. Um, so you get bytes by byte. That means you have to keep track of where you are in your byte sequence. And this then just calls for finite state machines. So if, for instance, you want to open a file, well, in state zero, you clean up memory and you're done. The next thing to follow in states one and two is the length of the file name. That thing can be 16 bit, bits long, bytes long. Uh, sorry. Uh, the length field that's two bytes or so 16 bits, that file name could in theory be 64 kilobytes long. Well, it is not, but still. Uh, then you catch the file name. Once you're done, you open the file. Uh, remember uh, the read to open this with F open is that we later on need to read from a stream because the runtime environment wants to see a uh, source code line by line, at least in this case. We hold on, we return the file number, we hold on to the file pointer and we are done. Closing the file, same thing, but here we need to make sure that we get the file handle uh, handed over, but we open the file at the stream. So we have to do a little bit of sanity checking. Not that um, we end up with, uh, not that we end up with a file name or with, with an out of bounds access and so on and so forth. We have read file, write file, same finite state machine concept. Some of these are not implemented yet. For instance, I did not have a good use case for a seek. I have a use case for create. An open is open a file for read, apparently. The documentation is a little bit economical in that regard. A create is being used when I want to write a file. So yes, this is backed. Delete, list, X list read uh, are not implemented. I didn't have use for them just yet. Um, read line, on the other hand, is used by the um, is used by the uh, compilation by the 
firmware itself to compile itself. So we had to put this there. I implemented command. Why did I implement command? Doesn't matter. Anyway, those are the changes to this that I really had to write from scratch. Um, what is, uh, what else did I mess with? Oh, yes. There was, uh, where was that? Probably state.c. Um, memory access. Uh, one aspect in this that differs from the original is memory access. The original, do I have this here? Yes, yeah, state.c. If we look, this is my version. This is the original. Not quite. Long store. Here we go. The original had um, had a distinction. It made it made a concession to hardware. The concession to hardware, the, as far as the board design goes, was that the everything the the second half of memory was ram the first part of memory was half of it was an eprom so not a writable and the second part was not backed that means if you started messing around with addresses incorrectly a write to the first 32 or the first 16 first 16 kilo words would result in an abort because you try to write something that you're not supposed to, but nothing would happen. A read from the memory hole, the second half of the lower half of memory would result in an invalid address access and nothing would happen. Uh, there are two things wrong with this. A, it's tedious to keep track of this. B, it does not match the Novix, and I like the idea of having a memory that I could mess with all the way. And C, this distinction, doing this math in the traffic path in something that you do a lot has a minor performance impact. So therefore, I got rid of it. Instead, it's like every all the memory is accessible. This address larger or equal mem bytes is no longer a thing that could get removed. Um, and that's pretty much it. That is the other significant deviation from the original. Oh, and I changed the indentation. The original, I find, is written in a rather dense way, which I find less readable, but, well, can't argue taste. So that's pretty much that. This compiles in a New York minute. Admittedly, this is on a, what is that? Uh, 8 CPU old Dell 6, M6500, fairly heavy, fairly chunky, runs Ubuntu. Uh, it's snappy, but it was made in 2011 or 2012, so on something newer, but it will work on a slow system as well. Hardware requirements are low to non existent, and I'm pretty sure we have a megabyte of memory laying around somewhere. We run this thing and let's see if we are still alive. We are. Um, what else is, yeah, let's compile this. Load uh, up fourth dot fourth. The, the 
file that implements that contains the firmware remember it's not it's not done block by block by block and just contains definition it also contains directly executed command that behave the same way as if you type this in so it will ask you would you like this in for rom or ram and if for rom, if for rom then it's the addressing the addresses are for well the the EPROM that gets imaged at the lower end of memory. Otherwise, it goes into the high end. You can execute that directly. We want to compile for ROM. And we are done. We now created uh, an image of our compiled executable. Note that for that we are getting a little bit close as far as free code and free data uh, goes. So any major additions to um, the firmware, you have to be a little bit careful that you don't overrun, but then it is not a real problem to compile for more because we are technically no longer limited by a physical EPROM's space constraints. So this math would have to change a little bit uh, once you bolt on more code. If we exit out of here, exiting out of here, simple control C does that. Um, Single stepping, CPU register manipulation at runtime is on my list of things to do, especially because we have that already for the Novix. I would like this to behave at least in a similar fashion. If we take a look, down here is our latest and greatest file. We both now use bin to hex, provide the name, redirect the output into, well, a hex file. If we take a look at run, run already loads app fourth dot hex. So let's try to run this. Let's see if it still works. I have no idea while I'm trying this command to execute uh, to test if anything actually happens. It's muscle memory, and I'm. It's been a while since that started. Word still worked. Apparently, we are up and running. What else does it do? Oh yeah, let's take a look at how. Things look once they get them compiled. Let's do implement a quick word, something easy to read. And we do an add, we do a C against add 34. Hit enter. Oh, I love non printable characters. Okay, remember the original board that this firmware was made for only had the second half of memory. So everything from hex 8000 to the end of memory populated with RAM, the first half under uh, below 32 kilobyte was ROM or not there and therefore couldn't be written to. Because of that, we have we start out at address hex 8008 and that is before before that we have the link field for the fourth dictionary that add 34 is now part of you have the link field and the um word name itself Mm -hmm. Cornelius, uh, could you mind the time? Oh, how, how we are doing? 
Oh yeah, um, okay, I'll hurry. Okay, so we push onto the stack, the value three, as a short literal, there is no value stack of uh, 8,000, of 003 following. We push onto the stack the four and code the operation into the same word. We call an, uh, uh, the CR, uh, the dot function at 0533. Highest bit is zero, so the rest is an address. And we finally run a return. Cool. That's pretty much it. As I said, it's a work in progress, but it's also reasonably stable. Documentation is economical. Your mileage will vary. This concludes this little exercise. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. And maybe we do some follow-up workshops on that. Uh, yeah, pieces. probably. And there might actually be a... Um, let's code on the call and see how badly we can do exercises, which would be full-fledged. And I might do that in the um, Dallas Raspberry Pi user group, another outfit that plays around with microcontrollers. If that becomes a thing, or once I get to it, there will be an announcement in this group. Uh, Dallas RPI meets on the first Saturday each month, each month uh, at 10 a.m. Central. That is typically 1500 or uh, 1600 UTC, depending on daylight savings time. Mm -hmm. Questions, please. Don't be shy, I don't bite just yet. <laughs> Did I murder everybody? Uh, maybe overwhelming for everyone. Uh, uh, probably all be asleep. You know, Good. You know, the sound you hear after mu Mozart's music is um, silence. Uh, yeah, stunned silence. I have uh, murdered everybody into submission. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, Sorry about well, that. When there is nothing left to be said, then um, let's be silent. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, again, it's a work in progress. Yeah, we're looking for so, improvement. Uh, it's going to be eventually up somewhere. If somebody wants a snapshot, all doable, but don't expect um, the snapshot to be totally stable. And it's really just that that. A snapshot. So if somebody uh, wants to wants a look, see, let me know. Right. Perfect. Next one, please. I shall shut up now. Yeah. Let's have a look at the schedule. Who is next? Oh, that's me. Yeah. So uh, from the bits. And bytes that we saw in uh, Colorforce and in the RTX 2000 simulator. Let's go for um, a high level view of things again. So let's see. I share the screen and let's see. These are my slides. I will talk about neat words and define source libraries. And let's see what this is all about. First, I have to talk a little bit about abstraction. And that's something that is not so usual with force programmers that go down to the bits and bytes and think uh, that the things they see there are the ultimate truth, which they are, yeah. But um, sometimes it's good to have some word view of things. And we will talk about uh, what the technical way to do so actually is. And then uh, we will apply this to a word that I want to propose. And that's the word need, 
we already saw late earlier uh, with the spectrum next, we saw needs in action. And need is very uh, similar um, in that it, uh, it assures that a word is loaded. And um, needs, we discussed names and needs is actually used in different four systems in a different way, but need seems to be available. So we go for need and we will see how this works. And then uh, we talk about some implementations that uh, implement need. And uh, so that's the need words part. And then we have the define source library part. Um, how can we de define libraries that others can use in a way that uh, is good documenting and uh, helpful also following the idea of abstraction that we will see in a moment. And then let's discuss these things. So what is abstraction actually? So if, if you write a, uh, an application program, the idea of abstraction is to hide the implementation details of libraries that you might use. Um, what you get is some kind of interface that describes how the words or how the library functions are actually used. And this builds up some kind of idea of what uh, is going on. So you create things that you know at an abstract uh, level and you operate on them with the operations that some in library uh, provides. And what things are there and what operations are necessary are defined in, a, in an interface. So, and all you need to know from an application program is what are the things and what are the operations uh, you use, you can use and you can uh, work on with these uh, things. Um, and then there might be different implementations that uh, provide uh, the interface and the, the appropriate functions. And uh, so that's uh, the idea of abstractions. You don't know about the implementation details. All you know is the interface, the abstract way to use it. And that's nice because there could be different implementations uh, following different restrictions on your hardware, for example. So if you want to read uh, data, then uh, the interface uh, might provide appropriate functions, but you don't know whether this is a flash file system, if it's a file system at all, or um, whether there's some communication that uh, reads the data from uh, abroad or, or whatever. All you need to know is I want to open a data resource and then I read some data from it. Very similar to what uh, uh, Cornelius just described with this uh, interface between uh, the simulator and the host system. Yeah. You get some uh, promise of how things behave, but you don't know exactly how things actually are implemented and carry out. So that's that's the idea. And let's put this into an action. Um, uh, what we want to uh, provide is a an interface to a source code. Yeah. So we don't tell you how you get the source code, but what you can say is need with a name. Yeah, so need minus rot, for example. And uh, then need assures that um, the appropriate definition is available after that. And possibly it loads some source code section from a library. And the library could be flash memory, or it could be a file system, or it could be the internet. Well, we don't know and we don't care. All we need to know is after we say need name or need minus rot, for example, then we know minus rot as a function is available, as a word is available and we can use it. If we say need assembler, then uh, it loads uh, the assembler program for the assembler program for the platform we're using. If we say need Z80 assembler or ARM assembler, then we load an appropriate ARM assembler so that we can do cross assembly. Yeah. If name happens to be defined already, then nothing happens yeah, because uh, you want to nest need um, and uh, the sections that is loaded will contain other need uh, uh, occurrences so that um, this is used recursively 
to load things. And if two sections require the same words, then you don't want to load them twice. So that's the reason why. And then you need to name somehow from where the library source code comes from. And uh, so I use the word from for this, from with a library name. And uh, so that selects the resource uh, where you come, uh, where, where need looks at uh, to, to satisfy this. So need is the important thing and from is just something that is um, used by me to do that. From is not a good name because other four systems use from for different purposes. Need is free. And if, if you remember anything from my talk, then it's the word need. And I want to, in future, structure all my source code like this. Um, an application program just goes ahead and say what it needs by specifying need operations um, to make sure that all the appropriate source code is there. Right. So that's the interface. And there are different implementation of these source code library systems. And um, uh, in 1995, I had a talk at Euroforce uh, where I presented my simple source code library system. Use different words, uh, use require for what we today call need, uh, but require again is implemented in different systems in a different way. And there are systems that have like 4,000 or 6,000 words defined. So it's very hard to find actually um, a four letter word that is still available. So I'm very happy with need. We heard also Albert van der Horst talking here in the fourth 2020 Zoom meetings about CI force and his want feature. And uh, want is very similar. So you say want and a name, um, uh, and then uh, it loads from uh, CI force library, the appropriate definition, very similar to what need says. The difference is that want parses all the words on the same line until the, the end of the line and needs all of them. And need just takes a single name, which is a more simple factor. Of course, Albert also has a uh, factor uh, wanted that takes a character address and a length string from the stack and uh, does exactly what need does, a single load of a source code section. And very recently, Willem Overkerk uh, in the NoForce uh, implemented a flash library where the source code is placed into the unused space of uh, a Raspberry Pi Pico, where the force system is very small and uh, occupies only fragments of the flash. And the rest is available. And so he uh, put uh, system source code there. And uh, his need then goes to appropriate sections in Flash and loads them on the fly, which is very convenient and very nice. Yeah. And remember earlier, we uh, before having having need and the force, no force Flash library, uh, these things were loaded via the serial line. And that is uh, much, much, much slower, of course, than loading from Flash. So these are three different implementations of the need interface. So that's abstraction in place. Yeah. So if we want to exchange source code and the source code just says with need what it requires, what it needs, then uh, either of these implementation would, would work. Yeah, so uh, and, and the details of how to define the library wouldn't be uh, th that important. Yeah. And um, so I encourage fourth implementers implement the word need the way that I defined it in the interface and then do a source code library implementation like you find most appropriate. Uh, appropriate. So let's see, we continue. How would you define a section in my style? Yeah, uh, I have a word desires and that uh, takes the appropriate context uh, of what need actually specified what is to be done. And then I uh, uh, specify the, the word that um, uh, need looks for. And then I do conditional compilation. So this is how a section looks like. So if you say need minus rot, 
it eventually go to my library system and in the end come to this place, see desires minus rod, aha, this is what need actually uh, requested and it will load that definition. And then uh, it skips the rest of, of the library so I can selectively load just this section. And I use standard conditional compilation words to do that. In Willem's implementation, it's way different. Um, he uses uh, binary markers and special search words uh, for uh, finding the appropriate section. But the idea is actually the same. Uh, Albert van der Horst uses um, blocks and uh, his wand actually figures out on which block the appropriate section is and then he loads that block. Right. So uh, that is what you can do. And then the question is, how can you manage the things that you write into these kinds of sections? How can I structure the library code appropriately? And there are uh, small definitions like what we just saw, minus rod, uh, which don't need any more structuring. But there are more difficult things like the assembler or some, some uh, data structures that you defined that have in itself a interface, an interface uh, of words that you want to use or that you want to expose to others to use. Um, and those that are just used for internal representation or realization of, uh, of the code. And uh, the notion for that is we call these words external words, those that are supposed to use by others and internal words that are just used solely for realization. Internal words might change if you want to implement it in a different way or more efficient and whatsoever. Um, it's implementation part. And what is external is actually an interface. Yeah? So it is a promise that these words will stay more or less unchanged so that people can just go ahead and use uh, them and the implementation might change. But the way you use these uh, words are, uh, uh, yeah, are stable, yeah? And that is uh, what uh, unit is about. It's a way to structure things that go into these sections uh, in uh, the area of um, yeah, defining libraries. And again, unit is a four letter word that is not used by uh, four systems as far as I know, and it's well uh, matches what is done. Turbo Pascal uses uh, uh, unit uh, or Borland Pascal at some later space uh, uses it. How do you use it? You say unit, give it a name, and then you can do internal definitions that uh, are just for realization, preparing something. Then eventually you come to external, can define part of the interface, uh, words that you want to expose and uh, that you want others to use. And then, you, then you can switch between internal, external, as fits and as much and often as you want to. And in the end, uh, you, you say end unit to close everything. This might or might not deal with search order. It's just an interface. And a dummy implementation will just make unit a very variable like thing that just defines a word and external, internal, and end unit are just no ops. So then you can load uh, a code that is like this. And it doesn't do any search order manipulation. Another implementation would deal with this. Uh, NoForce, for example, has an inside vocabulary where all the internal definitions go uh, in their, all of their tools. And then external would mean define something in force and internal would mean define something in the inside uh, vocabulary or all the definitions that are internal definitions will go into the inside vocabulary and end unit uh, will just do nothing. So there are also for units uh, different implementation. Unit itself is some, or the way you use it is an interface, how you structure libraries. And there are different implementations. In Volksforce, we have something like headerless words where you could define temporary words and eventually you can remove them from the dictionary, the names of them from the dictionary. And then external would be just normal definitions, 
internal definitions will be headerless definitions that are, uh, just have temporary names and end unit will erase all the names um, that were temporary. So uh, there are all different implementations to do so. And that's the end of my story. Uh, I can tell you about uh, my implementation of unit internal, external and end unit, but um, maybe the interface is fine and you just live with uh, the interface and say, well, I can define dummy implementations unit being variable, internal, external, and unit being no ops. And then you are ready for accepting source code that is structured like this. So to summarize, I talked about abstraction, hiding details of implementations. And uh, there's a value in that because you can choose of, uh, between different implementations that are specific to the environment that is used and can be more uh, efficient in that environment. I propose to use the word need name in for source code so to establish that name is actually defined and leave open how this is accomplished. It could be source code loading of libraries the way I did it since 1995, or it could be loading of binary files if you want to um, and, and so on. And um, it's an abstraction uh, of source code management. And if you go for source code sections, then I would say um, uh, it, it might be a good way to structure your code, distinguishing between internal and external words using the unit internal, external, and unit syntax that I provide. Again, an interface, and there could be different implementations to do so. That's it. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm open for questions. Uh, John. Yeah. Yes, um, I was wondering how you handle conflicts with uh, similarly named words uh, from the um, from the source library versus the external. Yeah. The, uh, I, I handle these the way that uh, you normally handle these uh, with force uh, uh, also because uh, unit internal external end unit works very well with. Um, vocabularies and also need uh, works very well with vocabularies or, or, or word lists. So if you have clashing names, then uh, you have to put them into different vocabularies. That's something that is around need unit, internal, external, end unit. Um, and uh, most systems will warn you if you do have name clashes in that it gives you something isn't unique message or something like this. And if you see them, you have to be very careful of what's going on and maybe put um, uh, the needs in additional vocabulary. Or if your unit is actually in um, uh, implemented uh, with vocabularies, you can also use unit to do that. Yeah, so that's something I don't take care of and the environment has to supply this with additional um, <clears throat> means, but we know how to do that in force. Um, I have a remark. Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, want was uh, the same as need uh, is now. Yeah. yeah. And um, once you uh, uh, use a small fort, mm -hmm. then you uh, discover that you uh, need a lot of things, but you can uh, keep your fort small. So, for example, I have a this assembler and assembler mm -hmm. on top of uh, uh say i for it with uh <clears throat> less than 400 uh, uh words mm -hmm. but what i discovered is that need is that then uh, becomes uh, unpractical and mm -hmm. that is what i i have introduced so <clears throat> um i didn't like the lines for, uh, like need uh, A, need B, need C, mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. D. And uh, this, I uh, decided that uh, loading a word at the time that is uh, uh, pleasant, but you can use things, but uh, in a, as a practical, uh, as a pet 
practical matter uh, I have introduced one, and then the rest of the lines are uh, things that uh, I want uh, to yeah. have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the explanation again, because I was wondering why one uh, actually does this. Uh, and I find this very beneficial because now we have need, which just takes a single token and one that takes the rest of the line. There's no name clash, so we can have both. Uh, that That is quite nice. And it's quite easy to implement one um, in terms of need. Uh, because you have to parse the rest of the line and, and look at the tokens um, and yeah. then do, do whatever is necessary. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for, for the comment. Um, Christian, you have questions. Okay. Um, your presentation brought me back to a word called overlays in something that was probably some kind of fort on Apple II. <laughs> uh, what's the relation between, why did it bring bring back the concept of overlay when you talked about your word need? Do you remember what overlays were? I know what overlays are. I worked extensively with them. And then they were a means of saving memory because the main memory was so limited. And so you only had parts of the program in, in there. Um, and then uh, yeah, remove the code to load a different part of the program uh, to, to work with that. Um, that's actually a concept that you find, for example, in ColorForce, uh, yeah, where you have the apps that are removed. And if you load the appropriate screen, just load part and the rest is, uh, the other apps are uh, discarded. But uh, Neat doesn't uh, uh, have a notion of uh, overlays at all. So it, it could all, all possibly just add on top. There's no notion of an application or something that is removed uh, if you say Neat. So overlays were a kind of dynam dynamic loading of uh, binary code? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And and... I'll... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'll, I'll slip in another question. What's sure. the relation with modules using Zeptofort? Did you take a look at that? Yeah, I, uh, not exactly at the Zepto4 things, but uh, in VFX, uh, there are modules. And in uh, Swift4, there are packages. Um, and in other four systems, there are other module things. Um, actually, I think that unit is uh, the most simple one. It strips away lots of features that others can do, like reopening a package or um, um, yeah, uh, dealing with uh, reloading of modules. That, that is something that uh, is handled by need in, in this case. And um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, more an attempt of maybe we can find a common ground of using this. And uh, it's not that you pick up uh, the module system of another force system. That is not how the force community works. Um, yeah, so uh, it's more uh, my approach now to say, well, this is the interface, This that's a word, and it's not specified how it's implemented, but only what the effect should be, the interface. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Well, then, thank you very much for listening. And maybe you uh, consider implementing need uh, or use need in your in your uh, environment. So that would think help forth a lot. Right. Our next speaker is Bill Rexdale. Uh, if you you said you you had something or without slides, but you just show uh, talk, but uh, yeah, just go ahead and show uh, us what you want to want to show. Oh. Bill, the stage is yours. All right, did it come through on the screen? No, I no, I don't think so.
Oh, I did hit their sure button. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh, here we go. Yeah, we see the PowerPoint or whatever. There we go. We are we go. live. All right. By way of introduction, I'm Bill Ragsdale, the founding president of the Fourth Interest Group, 45 years ago or so. And today we're going to look at a simple little application that uh, would be good as an intermediate programming exercise in a classroom. It might be good um, um, uh, for a challenge where you want to have multiple programmers working on the same thing. And it is Pig Latin. I'm not sure how well known this is worldwide, but Pig Latin back in the day was um, a synthetic language that children would use, generally between the age of about seven and 10 years old, on typically on the playground. So they could talk to one another and uh, the, the kids that knew how it worked would understand and the classmates who didn't know would not understand. And so it was like a, an immediately developed secret language. We're gonna look how Pig Latin can be done in fourth. So the rules of Pig Latin are that you take your uh, normal word and if the first letter is a consonant, then you move the consonant to the end of the word and add a Y. In this case, this, the uh, consonant is the diphthong TH. So you put a TH at the end and add a Y. So this becomes isthe. If the word begins with a vowel, you just simply append uh, way, W-A-Y. So R becomes our way. So with this, in a matter of uh, 20 minutes or so, with a little bit of practice, you can learn to speak pig Latin. A, uh, if you say, how do I translate pig Latin into pig Latin? It's igpe atenle, igpe atenle. We're doing this with fourth in text. So first we create a, a text buffer, in this case, input text of uh, 500 characters. And we're using the Z comma quote to bring in a quotation that is uh, null ended. And we're going to be using um, the Declaration of Independence, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then we need an output, output buffer. So for our output text buffer, uh, likewise, we have a uh, 500 byte array, which we create name and erase. The uh, top level of this is that when we have the uh, line of text available, uh, the word run uh, sets up those uh, those values, and then it examines character by character, and then passes that uh, character by character while there is a non-null character into word process, and that takes care of the whole word. And then we uh, display the output, see what do we got. The uh, first case is to check for vowels. So uh, the part of the word process is, uh, Check for vowels at A E I O U Y. And if we encounter as the first letter is a vowel, then we apply the word for vowel action, which we'll see in a moment. Otherwise, we apply a consonant action. The uh, vowel action is pretty simple. We know we're going to just put the way at the end. So, in the case of the word, we already have the word in the output buffer. We, uh, we, we, the, the greater than a word uh, passes the word to the output buffer, and then we simply append W, A, Y, and a blank at the end. So that's translated a word beginning with a vowel. Uh, the uh, words beginning with a consonant are a little bit more involved. In that case, um, uh, we, we do the in out where we move the letter to the end, and then we copy the uh, beginning part of the letter uh, to the output. So our result, the uh, Declaration of Independence is one that we often use in fourth language uh, for text. Um, and it is from the Gettysburg Address that President Lincoln gave in 1863 in the middle of the United States Civil War. And he is looking forward toward the implementation of the fourth language on a nationwide basis. 
because he said four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. And ever since then, uh, we have uh, harked back to Lincoln's words on the introduction of fourth. The translation of this, I'll uh, try to read, but you can see how it is with the um, the uh, four as the word first word is Orfe, where we take that F, put it at the end at A-Y. So it's Orfe, or Kortse, Andway, Evene, Yearsway, Aguwe, Arwe, Othersfe, Rothbe, Orthbe, Onwe, Histe, Huntingland, K, Awe, Enwe, Asian Nay. So um, to the untrained ear, it does sound like a foreign language, but to children on a playground, uh, it can be a lot of fun. And do we have any questions? Oh, uh, uh, the questions. First, I used a, the input string was null delimited. It becomes easier to parse letter by letter, just looking for a null at the end. And the output, of course, we're going to display it. So that format is better as a counted string. And upper and lowercase letters are a bother, so I just out set all the output to lowercase. And do we have any questions or comments? Thank you very, very much. Good. I'll return this to Ulrich. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So are there any questions? Uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to do a, a little class exercise introducing forth uh, from a tech standpoint, this is, this is a... This is a very straightforward, very cute, clever uh, way. Mm -hmm. uh, Only two. I just saw in the output that you didn't uh, move the th uh, on the word this. Both well, left uh, to the, the first, end. The, the first thing I mentioned was the diphthong th. So yeah. you do have to detect the um, one le the, the letter combinations that are actually two letters pronounced as one, and so. Uh, I did it in a fairly straightforward way here. Um, there are, I believe, I did an expanded code on that, and I believe there are about 11 of the uh, two-letter combinations you have to process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's been a Christian, pleasure. Christian, did you have a question? You raise your hand. I'll say, yes. you know, they have a what? Well, it's more a comment. I could have used this... Uh, probably 69 years ago in primary school. I never could speak big language and nobody could ever teach me how to speak it. They they gave, they gave tried by example, but I couldn't pick the rules. <laughs> so thanks. But I think the rules were different in French because everything <laughs> didn't end in way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. But it, it would simplify poetry quite a bit. <laughs> For the rhymes. I do hope I do hope Pig Latin continues on the school grounds today. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but again, we're talking something that's about seventy years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. So this concludes the presentation part of our meeting. And so if you later watch this on YouTube, thank you very much for watching. And I will stop the recording right now. And... Um...